Are you ready? Good evening and welcome to the ordinary meeting of the First City Council on the 25th of March 2024. Acknowledgement of country. Lithgow City Council acknowledges the Wiradjuri Elders past and present of the Wiradjuri Nation, the original custodians of the land on which Lithgow's communities reside. The Council also extends our respects to our neighbouring nations. Declaration of webcasting. I inform all those in attendance at this meeting that the meeting is being webcast and those in attendance should refrain from making any defamatory statements concerning any person, councillor, or employee and refrain from discussing those matters subject to closed council proceedings as indicated in clause 14.1 of the Code of Meeting Practice. Thank you all councillors are present this evening. There's no apologies. Declarations of interest tonight? No declarations of interest? Before we commence the formal part of the meeting, I request all councillors' attention just for a moment while I make an important statement. As chair of this meeting, I want to be very clear about my expectations of councillors throughout the course of this meeting. I made this, I made this same sort of statement prior to our most recent information session, and I was very pleased with the conduct of all councillors at that meeting. Thank you, councillors. You will see the, that the administration has placed on your desk a copy of a page from the council's adopted code of meeting practice. This outlines the principles that should be followed by councillors and staff during a meeting. I especially bring all councillors' attention to the following three principles. Trusted. This means the community has confidence that councillors and staff act ethically and make decisions in the interests of the whole community. Respectful. This means councillors, staff and meeting attendees treat each other with respect. Orderly. This means councillors, staff and meeting attendees behave in, way, in a way that contributes to the orderly conduct of the meeting. I look forward to your support for this meeting being conducted in an orderly and respectful manner. I believe this will help to demonstrate to the community that this council acts in the interests of the whole community, leading to our community trusting us. Uh, Madam Mayor, yes, could I ask why you missed out on, on the third one, which was effective, meetings are well organised, effectively run and skillfully chaired? Mr General Manager, thank you. I think um, Councillor Leslie's quoting from, I think there's seven or eight principles and uh, the Mayor and I spoke about this and uh, all uh, councillors, uh, of course, um, understand the code of meeting practice and uh, they're wanting, uh, they need to comply with all of the principles of which Councillor Leslie's referring. Uh, but the Mayor's merely bringing uh, three of the particular principles to the council's attention so we have more orderly, respectful uh, meetings. Uh, Madam Mayor, that's incorrect. I was quoting from the extract from the Council's adopted code of meeting practice that you handed out at the information session. Uh, you then, in bold, you then read out three of the four in bold, but you failed to read out this particular fourth one. I was, ask, on I was asking you to know why you did. Confirmation of the previous minutes. Confirmation of the minutes of the extraordinary meeting of council held on the 20th of February 2024. Can I have somebody move that? Thank you. Can I ask a question, Mayor Statham, about the minutes? Yes, certainly, <coughs> Councillor. Um, through you, Mayor Statham, to the uh, General Manager, to Mr Edgecombe, um, tell me where we're up to with the business of great urgency that I raised, uh, that I raised in relation to the pothole on Piper's Flat Road last meeting. Um, thank you. Through you, Mayor Statham. Uh, I'll take that on notice and I'll get back to you by memo first thing in the morning. But it was passed on to the engineering management. So yeah. yeah, it was passed on to the engineering management. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Council Goodwin and Mr um, Edgecombe. Can I have a mover, please, for the minutes? Thank you, Councillor Bryce. 
A seconder, thank you. Councillor Goodwin, all those in favour say aye. Carried, thank you. Commemorations and announcements. Oh, sorry, the three. Uh, confirmation of the minutes of the ordinary meeting held on the 26th of February. Could have somebody move these minutes to correct, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bryce. Have a seconder, thank you. Councillor O'Connor, all those in favour say aye. Carried, thank you. Confirmation of the minutes of the extraordinary meeting of council held on the 11th of March 2024. Can I have a mover, please? Councillor O'Connor, second to Councillor Bryce. Thank you. I'll put that to the council. Thank you. All those in favour say aye. Thank you. Carried. Yes, commemorations and announcements this evening. Uh, congratulations to Brad DeLosa, a local uh, wood chopper who's done incredible to win the uh, Timber Sports Australia. Brad is now going to Milan to represent Australia in Italy uh, in May. So well done to our champion wood chopper, Brad DeLosa. I have three very sad um, commemoration announcements tonight. Cole Ferguson from Parmesoki, George Cornell from Mythgo and Peter Moore from Taraná. These three have been amazing in what they've done in their lives in our local government area. Between them, I think I worked out it could have been over, well, I won't say an exact um, statement of uh, how many years, but decades and decades of incredible work from tidy towns to the RFS to many other uh, associations. And for Peter Moore, uh, I know all these people really well personally, and for Peter Moore, who lost his only child a year and a half ago now, his wife uh, is um, extremely distraught. And I would like to say that we could have uh, one minute silence, please, for these three people that have had decades of work in our local community. Thank you. And on a brighter note, uh, congratulations to Lithgow Show Society, uh, the volunteers and supporters of the show, absolutely outstanding. And I think that uh, we need to be very proud that we still have a show in our small country towns and continue to have shows all around uh, our local region. Thank you. Um, public forum this evening. Is there anybody wishing to speak in public forum tonight? Thank you. First tonight we have Chris Brandt. Can I please have Chris come to the microphone? Thank you. Good evening and thank you, Mayor Statham, uh, for this opportunity to address council and I think council, thank councillors as well. My name is Chris Brandt and I speak on behalf of my uh, partner, Janet, who is here with us tonight, and my um, sister-in-law, Julianne, who unfortunately can't make it tonight. The issue I wish to address is Council's Policy 1013 on the removal of trees from public <coughs> land. Last June, we purchased uh, 190, 1994 Genoma Caves Road, Hampton, uh, a property that some may recall in its last iteration as the Hampton Roadhouse. The property was extremely run down and in poor condition and had as its immediately previous owner a gentleman who could only be described as suffering from an obsessive compulsive hoarding disorder. <laughs> Nonetheless, the property has at its centrepiece a double-fronted timber cottage dating back to the late 19th century and a smaller cottage of similar appearance added a short time later. This has given rise to Lithgow City Council placing the entire property on its local heritage register. That's the good part. However, the property is extremely overgrown and home to some 15 radiata pines, reaching heights of up to 30 metres. 
uh, they are very prone to drop in large bales and which, uh, have, which have actually, according to my arborist report, reached the end of their useful life. Should a tree fall, the damage to the heritage fabric could be catastrophic. Since we purchased Hampton, we have at our own expense removed from the property eight 30 metre rayed out of pines from, and with another five to be removed when we can improve access to them. The remainder of the trees, nine in total, are located on adjoining public land fronting Wickety War Road, a formed dirt road, the responsibility of council. Mr Creelman of council very kindly met with us on site last year to discuss these trees and suggested that if we wanted them removed by council, we should engage a level five qualified arborist to prepare a report for submission to council. This we have done, and on the 14th of December last year, we emailed Mr Creelman a copy of the report and requested council remove the identified trees. Meanwhile, we have been attempting without success to gain insurance over the property. The issue facing us is what I would call a classic uh, catch-22 situation. Any insurance proposal we submit must disclose all identifiable risks, in this case, damage from the trees. However, disclosure of this risk has resulted in insurance companies declining to offer any cover. Our plans for Hampton include restoration of the heritage buildings and the conversion of the roadhouse into an art gallery, which we believe will be a significant contribution to the local art community. We understand there is a cost to council in removing trees from public land and we are prepared to assist in the clean-up. Accordingly, we respectfully submit that council agree to meet the cost of removal of the identified trees and provide a timetable within which to complete the works. I thank you all for listening to our submission. I have prepared a handout if council so uh, wish I could uh, leave with the respective councillors and yourself. Uh, Madam. Finally, may I add that anyone is welcome to come and visit us. Um, anytime, just give me a call. My number is 0459 464 868. It is in the handout and we would be very glad to see you and discuss it with you. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr Brand. Uh, there'll be a council person contact you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Mr. Ray Smith, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to speak in response um, to the decision making by council administration regarding the submission application and of the general information requested by the ratepayers. I recently recently sent a submission to council in regards to the road closures at Lake Law and asked for the defined points of closure. These were for Thomas Mitchell Drive, Ludding County Road and Lockyer's Line of Road. The only information received back was on Sir Thomas Mitchell Drive, which is still much an undefined closure point. My last correspondence with Council's property and legal advisor stated the general manager had considered my submission and had determined to proceed with the closures. I then spoke to the property and legal officer and sought further answers, asked in the submission. This was refused and the conversation was abruptly terminated. One might say she hung up. In summary, only one defined answer was given for Thomas Mitchell Drive, none for Bloody Cutting Road, none for Lockyer's Liner Road. Furthermore, no answers were supplied as to the recent closure of Sir Thomas Mitchell Drive. When this happened, council administration was questioned through Jonathan Edgecombe, who I personally spoke to him, on this subject. He said it was done because of public liability and done under the guise of a safety audit. Has or has not that safety audit been done? Questions still remain unanswered. As to this being a supposedly democratic process on decision making, concerning these submissions, one can only imagine. No answers or reasons are given. Make the decision and hope the public takes no notice. This is possibly why some of the submission notifications are advertised publicly just before or during a holiday break. Councillors, I say to you, you should look at these 
authoritarian type decision making processes. Is complete information supplied to some of yours, all yours, or none at all before this decision is made on your behalf? Would a request of a gipper from the public have a better result? Further, I'd like to ask a question on who completed the survey along Magpie Hollow Road and Sir Thomas Mitchell. Is it done by council or by who? Who is paying for the maintenance of such, of these such roads? And is the road improvement we expect to be done? Is it being funded by you or other areas of, of uh, concerns? Seriously, a number of issues have arisen I've noticed in council, I've attended quite a lot of meetings. I've heard a lot of words used that probably are defamatory. I heard Mayor Statham read this out just a minute ago, trying to clear the air. Doesn't seem to work. This relates to poor outlook for the community in general. Happy to move an extension. Thank you, Councillor Coleman. Look. Have a second to thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ring. All those in favour say aye. Carried, thank you. At a recent council meeting, I noticed that uh, there was a, a motion put forward. A, guy, a person spoke very strongly against this and then voted for it. I don't know how that goes over the public. It doesn't sit too well. If Lithgow is to move forward, we need to change the makeup of council and how, thing, how it thinks. Members of the administration may move on, but we locals will be less left to persevere to better our community. I would like to thank Council for thanking me for showing the time and interest in my submission. But the only rec recognition any submission seems to get is it has actually been received. Unfortunately, I don't think submissions are worth the paper they're even written on. I strongly advise the constituents of the area to participate and resource information for what is best, best for Lithgow and the surrounding area for the future to come. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Smith. The General Manager would like to make a comment on that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr Smith, for, for your comments and um, for the public in the gallery, but also at home, and for the councillors' information, if I can just provide a concise summary of the situation. There was a time when Lake Lyle didn't exist in Lithgow's history, and there were roads that ran across that valley. Lake Lyle was then created, and that left portions of those roads underwater. The council many years ago, this council resolved um, to close those roads as part of a transfer, or to swap those roads underwater, that land, for, for other parcels of land. For other parcels of land on the foreshore. So the roads are underwater. This council, moved down the process to close those roads, sections of roads that are underwater. Um, we exhibited those road closures once. We followed all statutory processes. We exhibited a second time um, to avoid any inference that it was being rushed over Christmas. We advertised on both occasions. I'm very aware that um, Council dealt uh, extensively uh, with each of Mr Smith's representations and responded to them. And I'm also aware that this council is very familiar with the customer service ethic, which I credit as being quite exceptional by a property and legal officer. And whilst I hear Mr Smith's words, I say to the public that we've acted most appropriately, most ethically, with, uh, with tremendous uh, consultation with the community. And the only sections of road that are closed are sections that are underwater and have been underwater for decades now. Thank you, Mr. General Manager. We're going on to eight. Okay. Um, page six, thank you. Presentations. Uh, Mr. Ross Gurney is going to have the Chief Financial um, Audit now. So we hope we're going to be able to connect up to these systems. Thank you. Yep. Can I just explain uh, for the Council? Um, the external auditor is presenting tonight on the audit of the financial statements. We would normally, and we requested um, that uh, he be present in the gallery, which is preferred, or in the chamber. Um, however, he's got a broken foot, so he isn't able to be here. 
We hope the technology works as smoothly as it can and you'll see his presentation on the screen. All right, thank you, Ross. We're on the first slide, Gabriel, and we're on the opening slide. On All right, thanks, Ross. Thank you. Um, thanks for everyone for having me, and I'm sorry I couldn't be in there, uh, be there in person. Um, I'm just going to try and uh, run through the slide. Uh, Ross, if you can go to the second uh, slide, that would be great. Oh, oh, sorry, the third one, I would say, third one. Yep, we're on the audit overview. Yes. So what I'm going to be speaking to today, um, it's just to start with that uh, the councils have been issued on a qualified audit opinion. Uh, what I mean is that the, the council's got a clean bill um, for uh, 2023. And then I will be talking to the key audit risk uh, as well, which was um, included in the annual engagement plan that was sent to the council at the earlier uh, beginning of the year. Uh, that was last year. Uh, some of the risk area as the uh, focus area of the audit and some of the work we've done around that and the observation of that as well. And I also mentioned about there's no material misstatement noted, which is why we'll be able to uh, issue unqualified audit opinion as well. And there was no issue in terms of compliance with legislative, legislative requirements as well. And I will finish it up with uh, some recommendation for improvement uh, as well. Um, the next slide, uh, Ross. Okay. Um, assessing fair value. Yes. Uh, one of the key focus areas that we identified during the audit uh, strategy was the assessing fair value of the IPP. As uh, everyone is aware that the significant portions on the balance sheet of the council is the infrastructure plans and uh, property improvement. So there's some of the uh, property that doesn't require to be uh, fair value during the year. So we have to conduct the assessment or the management have to conduct an assessment of the fair value to make sure that when we're reporting it to the council, that the value is actually not being misstated. And so council is, you, they've used an indexation uh, on that. And at the back of that, we've uh, come up with about 33, point, uh, 33 million uh, recognized as an increment, increment uh, during the year as well. Next one, please. Okay, that's really so Yes, so the other one is the revaluation of IPP uh, as in relation to council uh, policy and also accounting standard. Uh, every five years or before five years, if we uh, noted that there's a significant movement in some of these assets, they will need to be uh, revalued uh, just to make sure that they're not misstated in financial statement. So last, in 2023, uh, there was a five areas that have been identified as part of our audit strategy that needed to be fair value, uh, which council have engaged an external valuer to perform. Uh, that area has been building community land, operation land, water supply network and sewage network as well. And we did some uh, extensive um, review over this uh, process of what was conducted. And at the back of that, we came up with about 65.1 million uh, overall increments on that fair value as well. Next one, uh, Ross. Okay, quality and timeliness, yes. Yeah, um, this one of the area I think was identified not just specific to Legal City Council, I think it's a lot of council across New South Wales um, as well that this area has been one of the focus area. And so this year, uh, I mean, 2023, we could have finished earlier. Um, one of the issues we had was more of the value uh, issue, which I just 
uh, speak to in the other slide. The problem we had was more of um, the value of making themselves available or making the report available in time, uh, which is one of the issues we noted in our management letter to the council as well. So it's not so much about council um, fault, so much it's so much getting that report earlier and making sure the council can do their review over that report. I think that was one of the reasons that caused the delay as well. Next one, um, Ross. Information technology. So information technology general, as a part of our audit, we usually test the ITGC uh, application of the general control environment of the council, of the system they use. And it's pleased to report back to the council that there was no issue noted, which is actually good things because for numbers of years, we have to note one or two issues. So it's pleasing that there's nothing to be reported back to the council. Next one, next one, Ross. Cybersecurity. Yeah. Uh, uh, Cybersecurity have become a significant area that everybody is focused on. And we've done a lot of review around that as well in the council and making sure the council have a policy and also make sure there's insurance that cover uh, council in case any cyber issue happen. And I think it's pleasing to also note that there's no significant issue being noted or any issue being found this year. Next one. Uh, capital expenditure. Yeah. Uh, as part of the process of the audit as well, we obtained the council uh, work program, uh, which is based on, which has been driven by the um, grant income received by council to complete some capital work. And we've looked over that to make sure that the recognitions of those assets and also the revenue as a part of that, it's been done correctly. And we are confident and be able to report back to the council that there's no issue being noted as well. Next one. Restricted cash. We, as part of the local government art, I think uh, restricted cash become uh, uh, one of the major issues because of one of the council that they end up in a negative um, restricted cash previously. So this become one of the focus area uh, last year, but we've looked at what can sort of done in terms of the management of those restricted cash and both uh, external and internal. And we are, comf we are comfortable with what can sort of done. So therefore there's nothing to be reported to the council. Audit recommendation. Uh, as part of the process, um, there's uh, two low risk audit funding, which was coming from last year, which has uh, yes to be resolved. And there was new one additional funding this year, which is also a low risk issue as well. And I'm sure Kansu is also working through that to ensure that uh, when the entry model starts or by the year end as well, um, this will or definitely be cleared. Yeah, uh, I just want to say thanks to uh, Ross, uh, thanks to the GM Craig as well, um, for their support all this year that we've been on the audit on behalf of uh, Auditor General of New South Wales. Uh, we just want to thank you to the team for all the assistance all throughout the years as well. It's well appreciated and um, thank you so much. And um, I'm happy to take any question that the council might have as well. Were there any questions from councillors? Yep. Um, thank you for your presentation. I just, just wanted to clarify that this was an unqualified as opposed to a qualified audit. Did you hear that question, Gabriel? Yes, I did. Um, thank you, councillor. Um, there is this is an unqualified audit opinion, like I mentioned before. Uh, it means that we deem the financial statement not be misstated, and we are comfortable with where we've landed. Okay, thank you. Um, question relating to the increase in valuation of assets. 
given that is there any uh, consideration of condition of assets, given that we have a large number of asset groups going into a failed or failing state against that value? So what's our, I'm looking for what's the risk associated with a trajectory where we've got a, a large body of deteriorating assets. They may have increased in value, but we may be facing a complete renewal, if not major reconstruction of some of those assets. So is this taken into consideration with the audit? Um, sorry, Ross, I didn't pick at her everything that the council of what I said. It, it was concerning the uh, valuation of, of assets in, and the, the, the increase in value when quite a lot of the assets are deteriorating. In condition. In condition. Um, that, that may be more for, for the administration to answer that question. Uh, yes, I, I agree. Um, Council, I think the management will be able to answer that question because um, in terms of the valuation, they have to make their own assessment on the valuation report that was presented as well. And in terms of the constitution assessment, I think it's also formed part of the valuation process that they go through as well. Sorry, one last question. So, sorry, I will, I'll add a bit to yeah, that. No, so when, when the assets are revalued, then that's when condition is taken into account. So they're, they're revalued, the, the assets, each class of assets is revalued at no more than five years. In fact, we're reducing that because inflation has been, been higher. We've been trying to, re, to uh, revalue the assets more, um, more consistently in a less of a time frame than five years, if that's appropriate. Can I ask one last question? Uh, the, the slide briefly uh, referenced the three low-risk areas. What are those three low-risk areas? Uh, the three low-risk areas in the audit management letter, Gabriel? Uh, so I would just, one of them is the accrual leaf, uh, which is we know that is very common, not just with uh, Lisgo City Council, that tend to be across the uh, a lot of states, um, audit, and also even some of our commercial entities that do audit as well, because a lot of people have not been able to take leave and because of the shortage of, um, of staff as well. So you find that council have a, a, a lot of people have a lot of SS, SX annual leave that they're carrying. And the good thing is that council are doing, uh, have a process in place to make sure this is get reduced, which is a good thing. Uh, the second one was what I mentioned before about the audit readiness, and it just has to do with the not be able to obtain the valuation reports in time, which has, has caused the delayed uh, that we experience in making sure that we can wrap up the audit earlier. And the last one was has to do with the uh, bank reconciliation. I think it was has to do with uh, check. Uh, it's just one, one check that's been on the bank reconciliation for a long period. It's a very insignificant amount, but as a process, we need to sort of identify that and bring it to the council attention. So in summary, that was um, accrued annual leave, um, audit readiness, and one unreconciled check, so they're all low risk. All right. Uh, thank you both to Ross and Gabriel for that information. Thank you, Councillor Money. Any other questions? No? I'll put the recommendation. Have somebody move the recommendation, please. Thank you, Councillor O'Connor. Have a second to thank you. I'm not sure who was... Councillor Goodwin, all those in favour say aye. Carried, thank you. Uh, just start uh, to thank um, Gabriel and the, the Crow team. It's their, their, this was their last year in this um, audit term and we have a change of auditors, contract auditors from the current financial year. So, so thank you Gabriel and the Crow team for all, that you, all your work over the last few years with Lithgow Council. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Okay, thanks, Gabriel. Bye. Yes. Mayor Stafford, can I move a procedural motion? Yes, certainly. Move that uh, 11.5.1 to be moved forward 
the financial statement for the year ended up ended 30th June 2023. I just think that while we're on the financials, it'll be prudent to move this report forward to be dealt with now. Can I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Bryce. Any debate on this at all? Councillor Goodwin, right of reply if there's no debate. Uh, I have a question I'd like to ask, if I may, Mayor Stephen. Uh, Councillor Goodwin moved it. Councillor. No, just moved it forward to the seat. Oh, right. Yeah, could I have somebody move the motion? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bryce. Move a motion, thank you. Yes. The motion. Administration and recommendation. Councillor Goodwin. So, Councillor Bryce has moved this recommendation. There is three. Yes. And we need a second. Uh, excuse me, just to explain. From what I'm understanding, Councillor Bryce is moving. Uh, Councillor Goodwin has moved a procedural motion. Councillor Bryce has moved that, um, seconded, it. seconded on page 31. So that uh, if you look and, down the and page, then, and then Councillor Bryce moved those three, and we're looking for a second. For that. Right. So uh, the three points one, two, three. Councillor Bryce has moved. We need a seconder for that. Thank you. Are we going to actually put the procedural motion? That would be helpful. I did put the procedural motion. No, we did. Okay, we can put the procedural motion. We asked if there was any debate. But yeah. I did ask if there was any debate, but I'm happy to put the procedural motion. All those in favour say aye. Thank you. Um, so we need somebody now to second that. Thank you. I assume that motion was carried, was it? That was carried, yes. Thank you. Councillor Goodwin? Thank you. Would you like to speak to that, Councillor Bryce? No. Right of reply, Councillor Goodwin? No, I don't need to speak. I'd like to Anybody ask a else question. Wishing to speak? If I may, Mayor Stephen, free you to the administration. Uh, back on the 7th of August, all councillors received an email from a resident about the rate increases. Now, the thrust of that email was alleging that council was in significant debt, which is why six million dollars was increased in rates. Now I know the reason for it, but I like it on record. Was there a six million dollar debt? Was there a shortfall? I'd like that answer for that resident because the response that he received at the time of the administration was very bureaucratic and missed the point of the email. Now there's still people out there who believe that it was debt. I know it's not true, but I would like a formal response, please. Uh, thank you, Councillor Ring. Mr General Manager, thank you. Uh, Mayor, through you, I'm probably going to seek more clarification. I, I can't respond to a memo or an email that may have been sent in August. So we're talking August 23, are we? Uh, can, you just, can you just frame your question or is you what, what you're seeking to be put on the record, please? Let, 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 me, re let me reframe it. Was did council experience in the the financial year under review a six million dollar debt? The, the the one that we're looking at the figures for now in twenty three twenty four. Yeah. No, not this year. The the one for which we've got the report for twenty two twenty three. Through you, Mayor Statham. Mr. Burney, thank you. Council uh, did have uh, loan borrowings in the 22-23 financial year. They were around about, in total, outstanding loans were around about 15 million. They were all for planned infrastructure projects, mainly water and sewer, that have uh, had loans taken out with council approval over recent years. <clears throat> There's absolutely no debt taken out for, uh, for council's operations. Um, in the current financial year, at the beginning of the financial year, as approved by Council, there was a working capital loan to assist with covering natural disasters. The, the $6 million that was referenced is, is really the shortfall in Council's income that was required to be made up with the special rate variation. So, just if I may, just for clarification, that shortfall was for works that needed to be done essential. 
Yes, as, as referred to in the rates uh, review technical paper, which has been published, um, that was the, the amount of income re required to maintain council services into the future. Thank you, Mr Gurney. Thank you, Councillor Ian, Mr Gurney. Any other questions? Right of reply? No, I'd, I'd like to ask a question. Yes, just, certainly, Councillor Just following Ryan. up from Councillor Ring's question, um, I think Mr Gurney's done a pretty good job of answering or attempting to answer it. My understanding, and if I can get this understanding correctly, is the Council ran 10 operational deficits in succession. That, in fact, the, the shortfall was a shortfall in income to address the operational deficits and go beyond that. So I think what Council Ring was looking for was um, is some plain English response to that. There was a perception that we'd lost $6 million along the way somewhere. Um, when in fact it was clearly year by year operating at a at a deficit. So is that is that a clear understanding that I have that brought forward the argument for the SRB partially? Sorry to put you on the spot, Mr. Gurney. Yeah. Uh, through you, Mr. Item. Yes, there there were deficits for quite a few years, and that that was effectively where council had a shortfall in in revenue. Just to add to that, I think this is very relatable for anybody in the gallery or watching at home. If you're spending more than you're earning, that's a slippery path and the city wasn't sustainable. Um, and so um, the uh, decision for the SRV was premised upon making the city sustainable into the future. Um, recurring deficits are a hint to uh, financial uh, unsustainability. Thank you, Mr General Manager. Anybody else wishing to speak? Right of reply, Councillor Goodwin. Councillor Bryce. Councillor Bryce. Councillor Bryce. Okay, I'll put the motion. Thank you. All those in favour, say aye. Carried. Thank you. This evening, I have two mayoral minutes. The first one is Creamer Park Grandstand. I recently received an email from a long-serving member of the Portland Colts Football Club Committee and supporter of the Portland Colts Rugby League Football Club in relation to naming of the newly renovated grandstand Cram Park in Portland to the Gary, better known as Snag Taylor Grandstand. The committee and life members of the Portland Colts request and are in full support of this and would like to see Gary honoured in this way. Gary was a well-respected player, coach, sponsor and supporter of the Portland Colts and is still a very well-respected, highly regarded man in our community. And we believe it is very fitting and, and an honour for a man who contributed so much to the club and community. Gary Taylor was an incredible role model for many footballers in the Portland area for a very long time. He was a passionate person with integrity and ability. The Portland community has supported Gary's wife, Cathy, through the trauma of Gary's diagnosis of dementia. I don't think there would be a local person that would not support the grandstand being named after Gary, better known as Snag Taylor Grandstand. My recommendation is that Cramer Park Grandstand in Portland be named after Gary Snag Taylor Grandstand. Is there any debate on that? Thank you. Yes, I'd like to move an amendment. Thank you, Mr. Stephen. Your amendment, Councillor. The amendment is that the proposal to name the Cramer Park Grandstand to the Gary Snag Taylor Grandstand be placed on public exhibition for 28 days in the event of no objections that the grandstand is named after Gary Snag Taylor. Thank you, Councillor Ring. Do you have a second to thank you? No. I'm happy to second that. Thank you, Councillor Coleman. Councillor Ring. Um, I have no issue with the proposal, Mayor Stafel. However, I think if we want the community to trust us, as you said earlier in the meeting, we need to be transparent in these decisions. And I've also had people call me about this, not happy about it. And I think if we put it out there on public exhibition for 28 days, if no one complains, we name. If someone does complain, then it comes back to council and then we make the appropriate steps moving forward. I think we've had issues in the past with naming of halls and other facilities. 
and I don't want to see this become an unnecessary fight or issue if there are people opposed to it. I think by taking 28 days to put it out there does, doesn't cause any major issues and it will give legitimacy to what you're proposing. Actually, Councillor Ring, I think that's a great idea. Um, I'd like to suggest the same and could you please pass on to the names that have complained to the General Manager? So, um, um, no, I won't be passing names on to the General Manager, Ms Nathan. It's funny, isn't it? I've asked over 75 people. They come to me. I didn't go to them. Ms Nathan, that's not, but that's not, a, that's not an I'm issue. I'm very happy with that, so let's withdraw it. Um, Order, Ms Nathan. You said you wanted this meeting to be run respectfully. I am not having a shot at you. I'm trying to avoid the same sort of issues that happened with the Scott Memorial Hall. All I want is the community to be given an opportunity to have their say. If they're happy with it, I'm happy. I'm very happy with that, Councillor Ring. Thank you. So I'll, I'll, rule, on the I'll rule on the point of order. Who did a point of order? Councillor Ring. Councillor Ring. Um, I'm happy to go ahead and, and what you'll suggest. I think it's a fabulous idea. So can, so I'm very do you accept the point of order? Yes, I do. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Councillor Bryce? I think one, if one or two people object, but the majority, overwhelming majority, it would go for it, then it should be named that. I don't think one or two people should be able to stop the naming of a, a grandstand or any other public, any other building. It might be out of place. For Point of order, this. Mayor Statham. I actually second the notice of motion. I realise that, Councillor so Coleman, but I've already said that I'm happy for it to go ahead. Uh, so that's there'll be no that's debate. That's if you want to speak as a seconder, that's happy, but, but that's fine. If you've fine. accepted it, Mayor Statham, then just put the motion. I'll put the motion. I'll the motion. put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Thank you. Carried. My second um, mayoral minute tonight is tidy town signage across the local government area. As many would know, I'm deeply invested in the future of this city. This goes on the cusp of significant change and I know our community is excited about what the future holds. It is time that we consider work which will highlight Lithgow's potential and focus people's attention on what this city has to offer. It is often first impressions that achieves this for better or worse. The town entry signs across the local government area leaves a lot to be desired. They're old, tired and have not stood the test of time. They are dated and, and look shocking. This is exactly the opposite of the image of Lithgow we are trying to convey to our beautiful area. As the council, we must make immediate action to address this. Every first impression is an opportunity lost. I recently had the opportunity to tour Kirkconnell Correctional Centre and the jail, and the people on site are cap that are capable of doing amazing work. As an example, they constructed the Correctional Centre entrance sign at the Lithgow facility. Made of rock and weathered caught in steel, these locally made signs would be an effective way to ensure that upon entry to our towns, villages, the residents and visitors are reminded of our history and heritage as a manufacturing and mining town, but also our future as a place characterised by resilience and pride. Within the draft 24-25 operational plan, the administration is suggesting that council allocate $100,000 from the local roads and community infrastructure program to address this issue and install three new sign entry signs for each Lerowang, Portland and Lithgow. The Correctional Centre have advised that each new sign will cost $7,450 uh, exclusive of GST. I propose that we, the Council, endorse bringing this funding forward to allow the immediate design of such signs and once final designs are approved by Council, their procurement and installation. My recommendation is that Council bring forward $100,000 from the 24-25 operational plan to fund the design and construction of the new town entry signs through Lithgow, Wollerowang and Portland, and in another budget, the other smaller towns will be certainly um, on the way to getting new signs as well. Is there any debate on this? Thank you. I have some questions before I support this, Mayor Statham. Certainly. Um. Um, so the questions I have is in regards to this mayoral minute, it states that the correctional centre, so you're looking at Kirk Connell Correctional Centre to do the signs, is that correct? Uh, Kirk Connell Correctional Centre and incorporated with some of the people from the jail. Uh, my question is, is 
Kirk Connell Correctional Centre. Is that within the Lithgow LGA or Bathurst? Uh, it's in Bathurst, but Lithgow Jail is in Lithgow. Right. My other question, if I could please, shouldn't this go out for tender? Because we do have a local procurement policy. We certainly do, but uh, may I say that the amount they're costing, I thought it would be triple that. So if you can find somebody, Councillor Coleman, I'm very happy for you to do that. It's I'm not staff. up to me to find them, it's up no. to the staff. Mr Edgecombe, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Statham. Of course, it's standard process for the council to undertake a competitive procurement process when we're spending $100,000 on any project, uh, and this is no exception. So um, they did manufacture the sign out the front of the Lithgow Correctional Centre, that's true, but once we have these designed approved and by um, approved by the council, we'll go through a competitive process like any other project, and uh, it's likely that the quote will be, if it's as competitive as, as is expected, they'll tender for the work and may eventually win, um, but it will be as competitive as usual. Thank you, Mr Edgecombe. Councillor Leslie. Uh, thank you, Mayor Statham. I received this mayoral minute at 10 minutes to six. Uh, I don't believe it could possibly be urgent. Uh, it's, it's clearly a matter that uh, we could, could have had notice of, but that seems to be typical of Lithgow Council's operating procedure, rush, 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 you know, do things at the last minute. Uh, I, I won't vote for it because I haven't had a chance to think about it. I haven't had a chance to uh, to look at the signs, for example. I don't know whether I like them or not. I, and, and I doubt that anyone else has seen the signs. Uh, it's, it's um, I just can't, I can't support it on, on this sort of procedural matters. Uh, but, of course, we're talking about the, the entry to Lithgow. Well, that I've had notice of t for 10 minutes on this, on this particular one, but I've been trying for the last six years to get th the grave in, in Lithgow Cemetery, the that's one that's closest. Council, oh, we're going to say keep on topic, topic, are we? Thank you. We're going to keep on topic, are we? Look, this is on topic. We're talking about the entrances to, to Lithgow and the perception it has. So... And, and, and I know it's got it's got everything to do with this issue because what we're talking about is 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 the Lithgow is Lithgow entry now, but we can't get that done six years we just can't get that done and everybody who drives past Lizzie? Lithgow looks at that grave and thinks Lithgow doesn't care they've left this grave which is falling apart it's the one closest to the highway and it's Fix that first before you start spending a hundred thousand bucks on, on, a, on a, on town entry signs that nobody's seen. Thank you, Councillor Leslie. Anybody else wishing to speak? Yes, Councilor Mr. Leighton. Um, look, I'm not particularly concerned about getting it at the last minute. Narrow minute you can provide verbally is my understanding. I'm not really fussed about that. What I am concerned about is I don't understand how they fit into our whole asset management plan. And you're talking about local roads and community infrastructure. This is a significant amount of money. We've got people out there screaming about the roads. Councillor Goodwin early tonight asked about the pothole that was raised in urgent business. We should have been able to have a, a response to that, not taken on notice. I'd like to see this discussed within the concept of the budget. We're doing that very soon, my understanding is. We'll have briefings. We've had the Finance Committee meeting cancelled, so we're going to have briefings on the budget. Let's talk about it within the context of the overall budget and then bring it back. I'm not opposed to coming back after we've looked at the entire budget process. We can still bring it back early, but at this point in time, I need to understand how it fits into the big picture. Is it a priority? How does this priority relate to other safety issues in our community? I need that information to support it. It's not there, so I can't support it at this point. Thank you, Councillor Ring. May I ask Mr Edgecombe a question, please? Um, 7,450, and we're going to use $100,000 as three signs. Could you please explain that to me? Sorry for no notice. That's okay, Mayor Statham. Um, it, it, that 7,450 is an estimate 
provided at today's date only, and it's per sign. So there's three signs suggested for Lithgow, Willerowing, and Portland each. So that's nine signs total for the uh, three entrances to each town. So it would, right. yeah, 7,500 times nine. Thank you. Excellent. 56,000. Um, anybody else wishing to speak? Councillor McGee? Yes, I've certainly seen the signs, um, and they do look fantastic. They really do. Um, I can remember being at a councillor training session very early in um, my term as a councillor, and they asked what was important to me and what I wanted to see done in the LGA. And I said roads, 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 and stuck to roads. And it was explained to me in no uncertain terms that it is a much more important role than that. You can't just be, it's not just one thing. There is a, a lot to council and what they do for the community. It's roads are a major part of it, sewage, water, all of those things come into it. But there's also just that civic pride and your first impressions are everything. The cemetery is out of our control. There's not much we can do about that. And we start rebuilding cemeteries, we'll never stop. But the first impressions as you come into town, I drive through them all, all three of them, every day on my way to work. And so you do see that they are worn, they're old and they're, you know, there's not that care that could be taken. And one, this town has so much civic pride that when you lift that first impression, that's when you also get the opportunity to tempt people to turn off and drive that kilometre down to the main street and visit our, our main street and the shops in there. And so I wholly endorse this. This won't even go ahead until it's all approved. I mean, this is only the, the beginning of the, the transformation of our entry points. But I just think it's the best opportunity. And I think the sooner that we start it, which is right now, the better it'll be for, for our entire LGA because it will not just lift Lithgow, Portland and Willerowang, it will give the whole area pride as, as everyone that drives through will experience that civic pride. It just, it's undeniably a good thing in my book. Thank you, Councillor McGee. Anybody else wishing to speak? Yes, please. Councillor Martin. I don't disagree with many of the statements Councillor McGee made. I think there is some merit in, in a some uniformity in, in town signs. Uh, so I'm not opposed to this idea in principle. I did walk in the door and I had 120 seconds to read three pieces of paper. Um, I can't in good conscience for $100,000 to be spent with 45 seconds consideration. So I'm happy for this to come to an operations committee, which is only looming a matter of days away and that, that we can get a little bit more detail and bring it back in front of the next uh, council meeting. Thank you, Councillor Money. Any other people wanting to speak? I'll put my... Oh, Councillor O'Connor. I think it's not a bad idea to uh, actually bring it to the operations committee and we have a look at some designs or whatever. It wouldn't be a bad idea at all. I'll move deferral. I'll move that the no, that the that it's. I'll move um, that this is referred to the operation committee for further investigation. I'm actually happy with that. So I won't put the motion. I'm actually happy with that. So um, if I'll everybody's, second that. If everybody's happy with that, I'm very happy for that to go ahead. Thank you. We have to vote on that, Mayor. It has to be voted on. I've moved it. Councillor Ring seconded it. It has to be put. Do you want to speak to that, Councillor Coleman? I don't need to, Mayor, but it needs to be put. Yeah, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. No one else wants to speak to it. No, carried. Thank you. Ten point one notice of motion, Councillor uh, Stuart McGee, rebate scheme for the fitting of reflux valves. Councillor McGee, yeah. have a second to thank you, Councillor Goodwin. Thank you. 
Councillor McGee. Yes, um, after the recent discussions that we had regarding the, the reflux valves, I, I thought to myself along the lines of what would Ben Chifley do, you know, like we're, this is in my mind a, a very serious and important situation that needs to be dealt with by the council. Um, so the main objections did seem to be that it was on the on private property, which is a major concern for council doing work on people's property. Um, also, you know, what may be found in contaminants and things like that on people's property. And also the way that it comes about is that we are short staffed. So even if we wanted to fit these valves, we probably would take just as long as it would to get the hydraulic report anyway. So in the money that we've saved from being short staffed, which is just over 1.4 million, to set aside roughly 10% of that to assist in a rebate plan, which I think the um, executive for um, putting forward that it's quite a feasible thing to do, um, that we can help in the beginning 200 houses, um, the first 200 applicants, and it, it may not even be 200, there could be 150 people want this done, but to at least give them the opportunity to engage a private contractor, to come and fit the reflux valve, um, to have it checked by council and inspected. Um, and also the other benefits coming along from this would be that it would check up the surety as it's listed of the system itself. So there does seem to be quite a few benefits from this and uh, I certainly hope that uh, other councillors agree. Thank you, Councillor McGee. Uh, Councillor Goodwin. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Statham. I think this is a good compromise. It takes the liability from Council on any works that need to be done on private property and it offers a rebate of $750 per household at the completion of the work. It was suggested by Councillor uh, last time that it, was, it would only cost $750 to do the work per household. This is the issue that's plagued our households in the extension estate area for years. There's money set aside to do the work on the sewerage systems to establish exactly what council need to do and this work has started. It's great to see that tangible, tangible positive steps have been taken by this council to rectify the situation that you cannot, uh, you cannot click your fingers and rectify uh, problems of the past in an instant but we're the first council in I reckon 100 years uh, that are talking posit that are taking positive steps to fix this problem. Uh, Councillor McGee's motion is a good compromise for some householders to access this rebate. If they can't afford to pay up front, councillor does have the hardship policy they can also access. However, if this gets on, uh, the rate pol uh, the rebate policy for this issue will be drafted, and uh, the details will be worked out. Uh, I'm not 100% satisfied in spending ratepayers' money on individual private dwellings, but this will assist the ones that are most affected and suggest it will only cost $150 per household, uh, $750 per household. This just takes a liability away from council on private property. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Goodwin. Anybody else wish yes, to speak? But... Councillor Leslie? Uh... Mayor Statham, nobody in this chamber or this city wants to see sewerage entering people's homes after a storm event. And I've been asked a number of times then, why did I vote against a similarly worded motion at the February council meeting? I did so because the implementation of that motion would have been illegal. It's here in the management report. Section 356 of the Local Government Act, you know, councils are not allowed to spend ratepayers' money on private property without going through a, a legal and legitimate process. Now, it's bad enough having sewage in your house, but it would be worse if the residents believed that there is, is a solution, only to have it you know, declared illegal. I can't vote, and I won't vote, for schemes that are plucked out of the air. Now, Councillor McGee is the chair of the, of the Operations Committee, and I would have thought that the proper place for this idea to be considered would be at the Operations Committee. 
we have in, in the paper here a two and a half page management comment uh, on the business paper, which goes some way to answering some of my concerns, but not all. We need a detailed report in a forum where we can ask about the legal implications, the financial implications, and the engineering and plumbing considerations. Now, there is a meeting of the Operations Committee now deferred until the 16th of April, I've just uh, discovered. And so I, I think there would be, would be sufficient time for such a report to be com compiled. I don't know if there is, but, and of course, if there isn't time for that, that would explain the complexities in this whole task. But here's a question. What if there are 201 properties 202 properties. Is it just bad luck, buddy, you, you miss out? Yeah. So I have an amendment, which I'd, which I'd move uh, at this point, that is that this item be deferred to the next meeting of the Operations Committee, where a detailed report can be presented for consideration. And if in the opinion of the General Manager, this time frame is insufficient for such a report to be developed, then an extraordinary meeting of the Operations Committee be called as soon as practicable. I'll second that. Thank you, Councillor Ring. Would you like to speak further to the motion, Councillor Leslie? No, I'm happy with what I've said to this stage. Councillor Ring? Yes. Um, I'm glad Council McGee brought this back to the meeting. I don't believe it's a, a reasonable compromise. I am happy with it going back to the Operations Committee. I've done a lot of work on this since the last meeting. I've spoken to plumbers. I've looked up a lot of information. We need to be clear. The issue of sewage discharge into residents' houses is not necessarily a direct consequence of the affected property having done anything remiss. The surcharge of sewage is occurring because of long-term negligence in dealing with a known problem. Stormwater diverted into the sewer system. Now, the previous report, there was only about 28 or 30 complaints registered. Um, the modelling gave us up to 500 houses. That's modelling. We need to know how many houses are seriously impacted. But the policy is also predicated on or well, the proposals predicated on policy 3.5 sewer connections, last reviewed in 2018. And on page 9 of 56, sorry, the policy doesn't reference either sewage surcharge nor the use of reflux valve. On page 9 of 56, it states, Current, council's current policy position is that the limit of ownership for council is to the first connection downstream of the boundary shaft. The report then goes on the state on page 10 of 56 that the sewer reflux playoff is placed upstream of the boundary inspection shaft. As I said, this, this was last reviewed in 2018. In 2019 and 2022, there were significant changes to the Plumbing Code of Australia. In fact, the, New South, the National Construction Code 2019 Volume 3 for New South Wales clearly states in section 4.3, where a surcharge is likely to occur and a reflux valve is to be installed, it shall be located in accordance with the following. Where the drain is in the inspection shaft or boundary trap, the reflux valve shall be located immediately downstream from the adjacent, from and adjacent to the outlet of the shaft or trap. On the diagram in the report that's in our papers, that clearly places it into council's lands, National Construction Code. Now, I'm also concerned about the costings. If it's staff doing it, council's doing it, fine. 750 might be realistic. I started looking up the cost of these valves, and they can be anything up to, I found one that was $1,900, on average $300 to $500. We've also got the issue that the pipes are either ceramic or plastic, either 100 millimetre or 150. That's a significant change. Now, they're an older property, so the chances of actually finding these pipes is an added cost. You might actually need to stick a camera in. That's $1,000. Now, 
But someone asked me the day we were talking about this particular issue, and they said, well, if someone puts a, a reflux valve on this house, what happens to the resident beside them? I don't know. So I think taking it back and having an in-depth discussion about it to look at all the issues is actually quite viable. I think we need to look at it. We can bring it back. How many properties are seriously impacted? Where are they? I'm assuming we know. I've got an old property in Portland. I don't know where the inspection pipe is. I've had a plumber who can't find it. So I think taking it back and having a good discussion and looking at it and looking at the issues and looking at possibly some of the sewer plans, if they exist, would give us a better understanding of the issue. So yes, I was very keen to resolve this, but there are issues that I don't understand. I think we need to look at and see what they are. As for it being on private land and spending money, as the administration's report says, it can be done. We have done it in the past. This council did it. And it just has to be advertised correctly. So I think taking it to the operations committee and discussing in detail, looking at all the pros and cons, and having an open, frank discussion would be the best outcome. Thank you, Councillor Ring. Mr Trapp, would you like to speak to that? Thank you. Through you, Mayor Statham. So to answer some of those questions or queries, Councillor Ring, um, what you're stating about the reflux valve is correct. It's downstream of the inspection shaft. In most cases, the reflux valve replaces the BTS or the ground drift shaft, in which position it becomes then the inspection shaft upstream of Council's connection point. It also states in 4.3, as you said, that the reflux valve becomes the ownership of the property owner. So that's in yeah, the um, National Construction Code 2019. I think it's been reiterated again in 2020. Yeah, that no, does. Yep. In the previous report also relating to the costings, I did put in there that there are some caveats, of course, to those pricings as that was put together based on some rough research. So some of those costings, yeah, could obviously go up or down. Um, it just depends on what the plumbers are getting the materials for and what their time's worth, I suppose. The market for trades, I wouldn't want to have it a guess as to how, how um, some of the tradesmen are charging time out or what they have to pay for their tradesmen to complete that work. Um, as I stated in a report about bringing it to the Operations Committee, that's fine, I can prepare a detailed report on that. Um, similar with the flooding issue, depends on what type of flooding um, the council wishes to see and those properties referred to in the report previous of shown that it was um, on mainstream flooding and that was how the 500 properties was calculated that well, the type of flooding can obviously change how many properties are impacted if it's overland flooding it could be a much larger region if it's only mainstream it could be a much smaller region that's affected by those issues but as you rightly correct and correctly point out we do have complaints um, we track those, we log those, we can go and check them, and that'll be reiterated in the report to show where those were. Um, a lot of the times, we, as I stated in the last report, we get a lot of them via calls, messages in our after hours. We operate as a 24-7 service. Um, sometimes they don't get to that point and they just end up on social media, so we have to battle with that too. But, yeah, we can certainly bring a report back with that information. Thank you, Mr Trapp. Thank you, Mr Trapp. Councillor Coleman. Yes, please. Uh, thanks, Mayor Statham. Look, first day I'd like to acknowledge Councillor Eric Marnie, who's been talking about this issue for the best part of two years, and so he needs credit for that. But I just have questions, if I could, please. I've Councillor Ring mentioned that the camera that they could explore the cavity would cost up to a thousand dollars. Through you, Mayor, if I may, my understanding there's only two plumbers in the Lithgow area and one in Bathurst that actually can do that. That's what I've been told. Is that actually correct? Mr Trapp. Through you, Mayor Statham, um, I know of two that do it um, as a pretty regular service. I'm unsure how many in the region have that capability. Um, they're certainly becoming more and more prevalent as more asset inspections are coming up and that sort of thing. It's becoming quite a um, large industry, CCTVing of sewer mains and that sort of asset work and quite a number of them over the mountains. But yeah, locally, I'm unsure of the numbers. If I could please, Mayor Statham, I've got one more question. Um, hardship policy was mentioned by Councillor Goodwin. Could I understand how that process works? Like how long does it take? 
how do they apply and how long is the turnaround in regards to hardship policy, especially when it's $1,000. Some people can't afford that. Mr Gurney, thank you. Uh, through you, Mayor Statham. We, we'd need to, or Council would need to, determine a hardship policy in these circumstances. Council's current hardship policy more refers to rates and annual charges, whereas this is a different scheme. Thank you, Mr Gurney. Any other debate on this? Yeah, Councillor you, you want it, you got to write a reply, I suppose, because yes, so haven't spoken to us. No. This is an oh, amendment. I'd like to speak against the amendment. It's like having the boogeyman in the room, all the things that could go wrong, possibly. This is, we're not paying for this entire job. We're offering a rebate to people who are seriously compromised in their cleanliness in their own home. Anyone wishing, if there's more than 200 people, then we will sit down and reassess it. If it's that popular, that more than 200 people out of the 28 to 30 that are primarily identified as being at high risk, if there's 220, we'll revisit it. But it's a, it's a $750 rebate. We don't pay more than that. We don't pay for a $1,000 inspection camera. If they want to put a $1,000 inspection camera up there, which I can't see it costing $1,000 to put an inspection camera up a pipe, um, we don't pay that. If they want to spend their grand the, that money, they won't get. They don't get seven hundred and fifty dollars as a rebate until that reflux valve is fitted. If they engage a plumber, a private contractor who cannot find and cannot fulfil the work, then that's not our problem. We do not pay the rebate until the reflux valve is fitted. But what we are doing is offering very much the same as when we got rid of coal heaters and things like that. We're offering to the householder's advantage to do something constructive and do it now. We are offering some kind of pathway forward whilst we wait on the hydraulic reports and all of the other information that is in train. Let's, Councillor Marnie, as pointed out by Councillor Coleman, has been talking about this for two years and they want to send it to a committee meeting where we can talk about it some more and become plumbers ourselves. We're not plumbers. We all have our own professions. And I think it's important that we do something and we do something constructive and we start that ball rolling now. This is not excessive in any way, shape or form. A $750 rebate, we are not, and that does not get paid until the reflux valve is fitted. The um, operation, the, I'm against this amendment again on the basis that the operations committee has been pushed back to the 16th of April and from there it'll have to wait until the um, council meeting and winter is coming. Thank you Councillor McGee. Councillor Marnie, thank you. I'd like to speak to this. Um, this is my first term on council. The first week on council uh, Christmas Eve, I walked out and met residents who had sewer coming up in their street and into their houses. I spent months, and some councillors might be disturbed about this, but I, I spent months walking through people's properties that had 30 centimetres of sewer surrounding their house like a moat. Now, this is never acceptable. And as far as Councillor uh, McGee's statement that we will only pay what we have to. We have a service value. We will pay for all of it because we have failed on our service. We're there to extract sewage out of properties, not deliver sewage to properties. So we've had a numerous amount of householders. Does it just occur in the extension of state? It occurs in Lower Tank Street. It occurs in East Mort Street. It's across the board. This is part of the problem I asked earlier on about the assets. We have assets in decline and they're failing. Now, I, I don't accept that it's going to be a lottery. Whatever needs to be fixed will be fixed. If it sits at 220, it sits at 220. I don't, I agree with Council McGee that we need to set some guide, but this is not the work of the individual resident doing something wrong. There's a reference in here about the smoke testing 
and the relationship to that. That's where previous owners or current owners made a decision to put stormwater, rightly or wrongly, into the sewerage. They own that, that, that issue, and certainly the property owns that issue. This is not the fault of individuals. This is our failing system, which is delivering raw sewerage into people's houses. So, I yes, the first two motions I raised when I walked in this door was about the interplay between stormwater and sewerage and community health. I've not let it go, and I will not let it go, until we get a fair and appropriate response to people. So, I, I have no problems with it going back to the Operations Committee because Councillor Leslie is quite right. Section 356 of the Act is very explicit about the expenditure of, of council money on private land. He, he was right to not accept it last meeting. However, he and Councillor McGee, as the chair of the Operations Committee, can produce a pathway forward. I don't want people to be waiting They've been waiting when I first got told about this for decades. So I want to see this move on and I'm, I'm happy to support a speedy approach to it, but I won't accept there being limitations on people having this matter rectified. In regard to the flood mapping, the flood mapping I think can at times confuse the issue because we have people sitting up in Wrights Road, we have people sitting up 20 metres above that flood zone who are being impacted by sewer. It's about stormwater getting into those sewer systems. So I, I do agree with you, Councillor McGee, that this needs to be expediated and dealt with, and I don't want to spend any more, more time talking about it. I expected a report to come back with a pathway forward. Um, we have a suggestion from yourself. I think there just needs to be a little bit of tailing around the edges, and I think we're home and then we can move on and get this thing sorted out for people. Thank you, Councillor Mani. Any other speakers? Council uh, yes, could Councilor I ask, uh, <clears throat> through you, Mayor, uh, to the General Manager, is there a legal implication, as they indicated, by doing this? Uh, is it legal or is it illegal that we're doing? Oh, I think this is a good example of the value of the management comment in accompaniment of these notices of motion because we canvass um, all of the uh, downstream, if I can use that term, uh, sort of policy positions and actions that would need to happen. So the notice of motion uh, starts a ball rolling uh, by uh, preserving 150000 and it instructs the administration, I believe, to bring back uh, the detail. On page 9 of 56, uh, we have a specific section there which talks about uh, council can give financial assistance and uh, direct money to a private property, provided it follows process. So um, by moving this, if the council were to move this tonight, uh, the, the council administration would then exhibit the, uh, the policy and the like. So there's no impediment uh, uh, to doing that. And it, sorry, and the report also speaks to, um, there is detail to work through, um, but, and uh, it flags that that would come back uh, to an operations committee if the, in both scenarios, if the original motion prevails or, or the amendment. Um, yes, David, could I ask clarification of the general manager? Mr. General Manager, um, Councillor Ring. You're talking about the part payment tonight, that's fine, but this section of the Act also allows for full payment by council if due process is applied, correct? Councillor Ring, you seconded this motion. Yes, and I'm asking for clarification from the General Manager. The clause doesn't fetter the amount that a council directs to an individual. The test is uh, what is legal, what is fair, and what uh, and that's the exhibition process uh, teases out whether the broad public thinks it's appropriate uh, to direct a particular amount of money, minor or excessive, um, to an individual property. So if the council decides um, to direct more money to this purpose, uh, they, they're not fettered from doing that, no. Thank you. It's up to the community. No, it's up to the council. It's got to go out to the community, though. Uh, anybody else wishing to speak? Right of reply, Councillor Leslie. Uh, yes, I have, some, I have some other questions that I think need to be answered and could be answered at the Operations Committee. 
for example, do all houses in a, in a vicinity need to be fitted at the same time? Or what happens if a house owner doesn't apply? Uh, will that affect other properties in the vicinity? Uh, is uh, different to different areas, you know, does it all have to be done at once or can it be done in piecemeal? Which of course is different from the getting rid of the, uh, the old donkeys. It didn't affect a different house, it affected the atmosphere of course, but one by one as each house went, the, the problem was, was fixed one bit by bit. But is that, is that the case here? I don't know. And, and, and I think we do need to have those answered before. But of course, the other, other thing we've got here is a lot of emotional blackmail. You know, and, and we really do need to consider these things dispassionately you know, to get these things done properly. And that's why I think it should go to the, you know, the operations committee meeting so it can be considered dispassionately. Uh, the word blackmail, Councillor Leslie, what are you suggesting? It's a phrase, emotional blackmail. It has no other meaning except for that. I'll put the amendment. All those in favour of the amendment? All those against? I'll call a division, thank you. All those um, against the amendment? No, for. Uh, sorry, all uh, for the amendment. Uh, Councillor Coleman, Councillor Ring, Councillor Leslie, and Councillor Marnie against the amendment. Councillor McGee, Councillor O'Connor, Councillor Goodwin, Councillor Bryce, Councillor Statham. So now the amendment becomes a motion. No, no. The amendment's lost. The amendment's lost. The amendment then becomes a motion. No, Thank you. Motion. We'll turn to the original motion. Uh, can, um, Councillor McGee Just moved the motion. Yeah. yeah, right of reply, Councillor McGee. No. Yes, I think it's a fortunate thing that um, that we can just get this ball rolling. I hope that this motion goes through from here. Um, I think that if it can be refined, as the general manager pointed out, this will be coming back to the operations committee anyway. And from there, if if there's a, a uh, sort of a feeling to increase this amount, then so be it. But I think that this is a very good start and it, it is proactive and shows that we are actually doing something and I think that it is well and truly time. So I'm happy for the motion to be put on the basis of this. Anybody else wishing to speak? I just have a question, if I could, please. It was mentioned by Councillor McGee that this was coming back to the Operations Committee anyway. Could we have that explained? Because that's not what it states here, but just further that's detail on that. That's what the General Manager spoke about earlier. On page um, 10 of 56, mm -hmm. just below the diagram, so there's a diagram of the sewer fitting. There's a paragraph at the bottom of the page. The refined and finalised process for rebates and the process such as eligibility, the broad process, can be brought to the next operations committee for discussion and finalisation. With respect, that's not part of the motion. That's my concern. It's not actually, it's in your management comment, Mr General Manager, but it's not in the recommendation. That's my concern. Uh, excuse me. I'm happy for that to be added to the recommendation. Thank you, Councillor McGee. Can I have a second? I'm happy to second that. Is that a point three, Councillor McGee? That'll be a point three, I think. No, Councillor McGee moved it. Yeah, the second. Do you accept that, Councillor Goodwin? Yes. Yeah. All right then. Any other discussion before I put the motion, Councillor Bryce? Can we have? Sorry, Mayor Statham, if I may, can we have that up, please? Just have a look. Certainly. Um.
Thank you to our minute taker. Thank you, Councillor Coleman. Councillor Rice. Um, with this amendment, oh, um, I'm happy to support this motion as it stands with the three points. Thing is, we all we do is talk and talk and talk. We don't move forward. It's annoying. Last week, last meeting, I mean, last month, um, there was people who, um, councillors who approved and voted for the amendment, for the, for the motion, and this, this month they're voting against it. All we do is um, talk and talk and it's getting annoying. Um, this motion addresses the liability of council. Excuse to me, work... Councillor Marnie and Councillor Leslie. Well, Thanks, please respect Councillor. whoever's speaking. Thank you, you. Councillor Marnie. Um, this addresses the liability and the legalities of council working on private property. Um, this allows people to put these um, valves in their in their properties. I um. I fully support it, and it is like the the um, changeover from gas from coal fired. It did affect the whole town. It wasn't just part of the town. It was the whole town when that was moved, and people were given um, rebates from the council to move away from coal fired um, donkeys and fires in their houses. Thank you, Councillor Bryce. Anybody else wishing to speak? Um, right of reply, Councillor McGee. Thank you. Ah, uh, yes. Um, I'm just very happy that it seems that um, we can finally do something about this and just show everyone that we are proactive about this and take it very seriously. I think it will also um, expedite all of the reports coming through, the hydraulic reports, because the more information that we have in this area, if there's however many people take us up on this offer as it's rolled out, will be more information that will go towards that hydraulic report and make it an even more important document into the future. Thank you, Councillor Lee. I'll put the motion, all those in favour of the motion. Unanimous, thank you. Councillor Bryce, use of council vacant Main Street shops during art trails. Councillor Bryce. Thank you, Councillor Goodwin. Councillor Bryce. Thank you. Um, I was approached by Sharon Howard from the Arts Trail Committee about being able to use the empty shops in Main Street to display some of the artwork of participants of the Art Trail. Obviously, this is happening in November. It's, um, it's just to bring it to Council's attention and um, obviously we'll be working with the council working with the Arts Trail Committee closer to the dates to see which shops are empty and where they could and what shops they could use to um, display the work that is part of the Arts Trail. That's it. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Bryce. Councillor Goodwin? No, I'm happy with the motion. Anybody else wishing to discuss? Councillor McGee? Yes, I really like the idea. It um, not only enhances the town to have artworks of all different genres throughout the main street for any shops that may be empty at the time and hopefully they're not. But uh, certainly if they are and the Arts Trails Festival is on, then uh, I think it's a fantastic idea. Thank you, Councillor McGee. Councillor Ring. Um, I have no problem with it in theory, but I would expect the buildings to be leased come November. If we have vacant buildings, I have no problem with it. We've also got the, the little gallery at... Um, the Union Theatre that can be used, um, and no doubt there'll be other <coughs> vacant shops at the time that could also be approached. Council could assist with that, but the buildings have to be vacant. Thank you, Councillor Ring. Anybody, Councillor Marnie? Uh, just happy to support it. I think it's a good use of our assets during that period. So if, if they are available, as Councillor Ring says, um, and Army, uh, Councillor Bryce, yep. Uh, Happy to support it. Thank you, Councillor Marnie. Anybody else wishing to speak? Right of reply, Councillor Bryce. No, we just need to work with the arts trial closer to time to see what is available uh, for the for the arts trial use. Thank you. I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Carried. Thank you. 
Notice of motion, Councillor Bryce, moving committee meetings minutes as a block. I'll move. Councillor Bryce. Councillor Bryce. Um, when I was, um, this came about when I was looking at uh, council meeting minutes that included Cessnock, Musselbrook, Maitland, Blue Mountain City Council, Bathurst Council, Orange Council. I was looking at these announcement and, and uh, commemorations and announcements and see what other councils were doing. And what I need notice is that they block all their committee meetings um, minutes as one and move and pass and move and second and vote on the um, on them as a block rather than individual. I thought this was a really good idea and the fact that it saved us a bit of time, saves a bit of time in um, council time. And if a, if a minute, uh, minute, committee meeting minute needs to be discussed, the rest can be voted out off, that one could be discussed and then moved and seconded. As... Um, and I thought it was a really good idea on saving time. And as a note, all those councils did the same thing. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Bryce. Councillor Goodwin. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Statham. This is exactly what I said in the extraordinary meeting last month uh, when we were trying to change the times back to six o'clock. To reduce the time at meetings, this has been proposed previously. However, some on council will not do this as they want to speak on every report, which is fine. Uh, but, but I think they just like the publicity. Uh, most of the... Uh, point of order, that's a personal attack. That goes against what you said at the beginning of the meeting, Council. Most yes, of the reports... I've called a point of order. I, I re, I re, I'll retract that. <laughs> that's right. Uh, most of the uh, reports are for noting only, um, not for I congratulate the staff for a fine report. It might be a fine report, but it just needs noting unless you have something constructive to say about it. This motion does not stop you from having your say about uh, the, uh, the item, um, but you can, you can put your hand up at the start when we block it to say that you want to speak to it. So I don't see a problem with blocking the meeting. Block the council uh, committee meetings. Uh, Mayor Stafford. Thank you, Councillor Goodwin. Councillor... Um, I was going to move an amendment to this, but I actually would like, if Councillor Bryce is happy, to put an additional point. I'll read it out, and if Councillor Bryce is happy with it, I'm happy for it to, to go in. Otherwise, I'll move it as an amendment if someone seconds it. And that is that the Council amend the Lithgow Council Code of Meeting Practice to include clauses 13.1 to 13.7 of the New South Wales Model Code of Meeting Practice. That needs to be in the code of meeting practice to give effect to what Councillor Bryce is talking about. Are you happy with that as an additional point? I'm happy, with that. happy Councillor Bryce. Yes, thank you. And that doesn't also mean, it doesn't necessarily mean it's only the uh, committee reports. It might be an investment report if everyone's happy on it. No questions. But I think all councillors are entitled to ask questions. And there are minutes of reports of meetings that put in recommendations that need to be discussed. And if someone wants to discuss it, that is their right. But I think it's a good idea. I think I'm not interested in reducing the time of the meeting. I'm interested in seeing that we spend our time on those issues that deserve more discussion. So I do support it. Thank you, Councillor Ring. Any other comments? Can we just see that? Sorry, Miss, if I may. Can we see that point up? I just like to look at things before I vote for them. Councillor Goodwin, do you accept point two? Yep. Thank you. Just a point. Um, can we just get the spelling mistake fixed? Anyone else? Councillor Marnie, thank you. Um, I, I'm actually going to support this motion and the amendment. Um, it's unfortunate that we'll run commentaries on why people comment on reports. If I comment on a report, I'll actually comment on an item. The committee meetings are there 
as recommendations from advisory committees from the community and other committees. They're there to come to the meeting of the elected councillors of the Lithgow City Council to review. If councillors don't have the time or aren't inclined, that's fine. But I will look at those items because that's part of the decision making. And it would be appreciated, Mayor, if some of the people perhaps on that side actually listen to what you said at the front end around trying to organise respectful meetings. I hear the same sort of commentary from a particular councillor who sees when somebody's done their homework and actually wants to talk to an issue that is somehow a political grandstanding. The, the first time I heard this term used in this council was from Councillor Daryl Goodwin. So I, I'll go home and do my homework, Councillor Goodwin, and if I come here uh, and I wish to order. speak to something, point of order. I will. Point of order. Councillor Bryce. Um, can we not a personal attacks on each other? We've we've tried not to have that part of the respectful meetings. Well, we, we did try. Uh, yeah. Me, Point of order. Chair. I agree with Councillor Bryce. Can we keep? Yes. Let's have some decorum. Yes. Thank you. I rule on the point of order, and I rule that uh, we do have to have respectful meetings. Thank you. Uh, righto. So, Councillor Bryce, right of reply. Oh, oh no. Councillor McGee. Uh, yes, I think it's a great idea. I think it'll move. Pardon? I, I didn't hear. Um, I think it's a good idea. It goes a long way towards streamlining the council meetings, which are just going to make it all more professional. And I think that's what we're trying to achieve here. And um, I think it goes a long way to doing that. So I think it's a fantastic motion. Thank you, Councillor McGee. Um, nobody else is wishing to speak. Councillor Bryce, write a reply, thank you. Um, not much, I just didn't think it was gonna go the way it did, but um, I hope that everyone supports it. Thank you. I'll put the motion, all those in favour say aye. Uh, all but one. So uh, carried. Thank you. Notice of motion, Councillor Coleman, six-month exercise membership, aqua fitness morning class held at J.M. Robson Aquatic Centre. Councillor Coleman. I've actually changed my notice of motion. Trinity's got the words. Um, we... Point of order, we, we've not had a chance to look at the new changes, so can we please defer it to another meeting? No, it's only slight change. Well, a change that we haven't had time to look at. I won't be, I won't be deferring it. It's a slight change. It's my notice of motion and I can change it. I thought the matter had been dealt with. That's why I'm changing it, Mayor Statham, if you cool. allow me. Yes, I will. We need a second to Councillor Coleman, thank you. I'll second it. Thank you, Councillor Ring. Councillor Coleman. Thank you, Mayor Statham. I have changed it. And it is on the advice of the memorandum this afternoon, even though it was received just before the meeting. I've taken the memorandum and I've changed it slightly. So my, res my Notice of motion is that Lithgow City Council acknowledge the importance of providing a six-month monthly exercise membership for the Lithgow Aqua Fitness Morning Class. Number two, a report is provided regarding why Mrs Deb Russell never received a response to her correspondence dated the 22nd of January 2024. And I'd like to speak further to that, if I could, Mayor. Yes, certainly. <laughs> Sorry about that. Correspondence was sent to the council on the 22nd of January, 2024. Further correspondence was given to fellow councillors on the 18th of February, 2024. I submitted this notice of motion on the 15th of March, 2024. A Facebook post dated three days ago on the Jim Robinson Aquatic Centre advertised a new booking system goes live. That's great. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. On the council website under customer service, customer service charter and standards, 
customer service function, customer inquiries respond to electronic or written correspondence is within 10 working days. The KPI is 10 working days. Sorry, key performance indicators, as explained on the website. Mrs. Deb Russell, as of this morning, who contacted me at 8.16am, is still waiting for a response from the original letter sent in on the 22nd of January, 2024. I think she deserves a response. I do acknowledge the fact that Mr Edgecombe has apologised and thank you for that. I appreciate that. And it has stated here in the memorandum that on the 28th of February, staff at the Aquatic Centre was going to reintroduce the ability to purchase a six-month aqua fitness pass, but it was on the 7th of March that actually Mrs Russell contacted me and further again on the 13th of March. So I would like very much so that Mrs Russell is given, one, an apology, two, a response to her letter that she sent in on the 22nd of January, and I would like a report regarding why this didn't occur. Thank you, Councillor Coleman. Councillor Ring. No. I declined to talk at this moment. Thanks. Got anyone else wishing to speak? Right of reply, Councillor Coleman. No, thanks, Mayor Statham. What I will say is that I just want to praise the staff at the Lithgow Aquatic Centre and thank them very much. I received correspondence from Mrs Cooper in regards to her late husband. The ladies at the pool always conduct themselves with great confidence and they were wonderful. That's the only thing I'd like to say in this instance. I'll put the motion all those in favour say aye. Carried, thank you. Page 14, administration reports, caring for our community. 11 Happy to move. Pardon? Happy to move. I haven't finished reading thank it you. yet. Financial assistant requests sporting representation. Councillor Marnie, and second to thank you. I'll move Councillor second. Bryce, uh, Councillor Marnie. Just to say thanks to the council, as I've said previously, and I may not sit comfortably with everyone, but I think this is something that this council does extremely well and has supported sporting people. This particular family has had outstanding success in swimming um, and I'm very pleased to see us as a council getting behind our young people and supporting them. Thank you, Councillor Money. I did attend the swimming as patron, the swimming... Um, evening and I suggested over the microphone to all parents that we actually help the swimmers. We very rarely ever get a request for or, um, or acknowledgement regarding our swimmers so I think this is a great idea. Councillor Bryce. Um, there's three, three people or actually six that are getting these. So we have two swimmers and um, three local boys who play basketball. Um, this is great. Um, at the last council meeting the swimming club did mentioned that our facility, that um, they had a swim, a, a regional swim meet um, and they said that our facilities, all the teams that are attended at our facilities are far superior than the, the other, in the others in the region. So it's good to see some of our swimmers coming through and, um, and get, um, getting through to state. Same as our basketballers, um, I think... Uh, there's got to be a shout out to Mr. Richard, Sh uh, Mr. Richard um, Marjoram out there at the basketball stadium for growing, and the committee out there for growing this basketball locally. And it's good to see that three of our players are going to state championships, uh, national champ championships. Thank you, Councillor Bryce. Um, anybody else wishing to speak on this? Mayor Stave, I have one question, if I may. Um, I don't, I don't know who's best to answer it, either the administration or someone from the sports committee. Um, historically, in the last quarter of this financial of the financial year, is it likely that we'll have other requests from sporting bodies? Is there anything on during the next three months? We haven't had too many. Oh, just from the sporting committee, we've not had too many um, um, 
a request for assistance this financial you know this financial year. So I don't see us getting many more. Thank you, Councillor Bross. Councillor Coleman. Yeah, thanks, Mayor Nathan. Do we have representation from the swimming club on the sports advisory committee? I can't remember. We do. Yep. Okay. Anyone else wishing to speak? Um, Councillor Marnie, write of reply. I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Carried. Thank you. Developing our own, our sorry, developing our built environment, uh, Lithgow flood pen risk management study and plan, two thousand and twenty-three. Can I have somebody move this, please? I'll move it. Councillor Ring. Uh, I missed the, the original briefing, but I did catch up with staff and I was briefed on this issue in detail. The staff answered the questions. Federal legislation does not allow insurance companies to actually use overflow in assessing risk to properties. We need to be cautious of that in our community, make the community aware of it. I have looked at Mudgee. Mudgee has a similar document, which was done two years ago. Same terminology, there's a government guidelines. It does provide us with a tool, and this is why I've moved it, it provides us with a tool to secure funding for government grants moving forward to fix up a number of the problems in our community. It does talk about 30 houses recommended for buyback, funded by the government, not council. Nine houses recommended to be raised, once again funded by government, not council. I think overall that there are positive benefits to this document. I think if there are still people concerned about it, then they should be free to contact either councillors or staff to get issues clarified. And I think people need to look carefully at their insurance papers and the houses when they come in. And if all of a sudden they're being placed in a flood zone, which is not consistent with the, the planning, which is a legitimate flood zone, then they need to be looking for alternate insurers. I think that's very important. I think long term, this document will help our community. Now, no doubt this will be um, reported on once it starts, uh, both in six monthly and annual reports. But when we do have our next operation meetings, I'm going to raise it as uh, an item that can be discussed on a semi-regular basis in the operations committee so that we have regular updates on forward works. Thank you, Councillor Ring. That's me. That's me. Councillor Bryce, thank you. I mean, this this was developed under the new guidelines from the government, with the over um, overland uh, flooding, as well as the risks from rivers and creeks. As far as insurance is concerned, I had a, a resident approach me and said that um, this was bef when this was early on when we started doing the uh, community consultation on this that uh, her insurance company contacted her and cancelled her insurance. I asked, I requested that the council look into her address and see what had changed. And if anything, on our new flood management plan, her house was no longer considered in a flood zone. It was the insurance company's decision. She ended up going to another insurance company, ended up getting cheaper insurance. So how insurance companies deal with floodplains and their own studies is totally different to what council, and I think people need to be aware of it. I mean, we've heard of incidences where people living out at um, Lidsdale and that area being told that um, due to the flood plan from council that their insurances have gone up, where this, um, and then the council had to put them straight that this does not cover Lidsdale so that the insurance company had uh, been a bit um, false in giving out information. So, and it does help us get um, funding at a rate of two to one. Is that correct? Yep, two to one. That means that the majority of the money will come from government by putting this flood plan into action. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Bryce. Anyone else wishing to speak? Councillor Coleman. Yeah, thanks, Mayor Statham. When I read this report, 
I was really pleased to see the statement in the middle of page 21, the Lithgow floodplain risk management study and plan 2023 is not an insurance document and does not provide direction on how insurance companies are to insure flood liable properties. I think that's really a crucial point and very important part of that report. I also want to make comment on the fact that if this is adopted, any grant funds then awarded under the New South Wales Government Flood Plain Management Program can be used for investigation, design or feasibility study for future works. My question, if I could please, Mayor Statham. Certainly. What future works are the administration referring to in regards to this particular paragraph? What plans do they particularly have if this is passed? Mr. Elwood, thank you. Uh, thank you. Through you, Mayor Statham. Uh, the floodplain and risk uh, management study has also identified uh, indi well, it's indicated uh, dire the direction of assets and some of the changes uh, that may need to be either amended uh, or put in place. Uh, the 30, uh, oh, sorry, let me get the, the figure exactly right. Uh, the 30, uh, sorry, $36 million uh, identification of funds required to address uh, all the issues uh, that have been raised in the plan uh, is an indicator of the extent of the funds that Council will need to source to actually uh, fully address what's identified in the plan as well. Uh, the two to one ratio will con help contribute to that, uh, but the New South Wales Government uh, Flood Assistance Program that um, we're referring to, the grant scheme, uh, also has caps on it. Uh, but it does allow, as you, as you said, to investigate planning, but it also allows for uh, the construction uh, of infrastructure as well. Thank you, Mr. Elwood. Thank you, Councillor Coleman. Anyone else wishing to speak? Yes. Councillor yes, Marnie? Uh, just if I could ask a question to Mr. Elwood, please, through you, Mayor. Certainly, Councillor Marnie. Uh, my understanding, rightly or wrongly, is that available state money is for stream-based flooding, not overland stormwater inundation. If I read that right? Um, Mr. Elwood. Through your statement, that is correct. Yep, thank you. Uh, look, this was a, a, a committee I was on prior to becoming a council. I was actually a community rep and have obviously had a long interest in flood issues and other water-based issues. Now, um, I think the point Councillor Ring makes is, a, is an important one as far as the federal legislation identifying clearly to insurers that overland flooding is not part of stream-based flooding and it shouldn't be applied in, in the same terms. Now, the challenge for, for myself as a councillor and, and the representations I've had is what do we do with the people in the overland flood uh, flow zones? which extend down into Western Main Street into a business precinct uh, when it is combined with sewer coming through overruns out of the sewer then we then have highly contaminated uh, flood waters. Those waters can either enter food places or in the case of the still dealership entered the still dealership and ended up with contamination of the pretty much the entire stock. Uh, so those people start to see significant um, impacts from the combination of the two things. Uh, I would like to add an additional point, if I could, um, that a stormwater plan is developed to guide council's expenditure through the SRV and other stormwater funding to address overland flooding and infrastructure that's not fit for purpose. Now, I need to squeeze that down from that big long sentence, so... Uh, just one moment, please. Councillor Ring, would you accept that? I'm uh, more than happy to accept that. All right, thank you. Councillor Money, continue, thank you. I'll try and squeeze it down, but, um, and then maybe speak to it, but that the Council develop a stormwater management plan for Maringaroo Fields and uh, Farmers Creek catchment. 
Um, the reason behind that is that we need to move people out of these red zones. In Marangaroo Fields, we had a subdivision that had a number of open channels which had houses built essentially in close proximity to those drains, those constriction points that have been then put in place as drain, uh, concrete and steel drainage structures are leading to water being pushed out through that landscape. Similarly, the red zone of Western Main Street needs to have a priority, as does a number of other localities in the, in the um, Lithgow Valley. Some of these things are going to cost plus a million. And because I know that I, I, I think Mr Edgecombe's reported to the council a number of times the progress on the first of those three key intersections, which I think is in it, well in excess of a million. However, some of the work, and I congratulate any of the councillors that were on the previous council, um, in the Vale, there was a small intervention of 40,000, which stopped about $1.2 million worth of houses being directly and, con and continuously flooded. So some of the resolutions are small and some of them are substantial, but I think we need to have a stormwater plan that outlines the pathway forward. And uh, I think if we fail to do that, that's where we're going to lose a lot of community confidence in this plan. Um, I'm moving from an extreme flood area to another one. Um, I'm aware of the consequences of that. Uh, and it is challenging for people who are living next to waterways. And the, the stress and anxiety that goes with that is significant. So we need to show that we've got plans for all residents that are being impacted. So if the mover and seconder are happy to have that additional point put in, I think you put that to Steve, uh, Council Ring, my apologies. Um, that's all I'd like to say. Otherwise, I, I think we do need to activate that public money for the, for the stream-based flooding. Thank you, Councillor Marnie. Anybody else wishing to speak? Councillor Comp. I just have a question in regards to point three, in regards to what Mr Elwood said. He said in regards to my answer that funding could actually provide, you know, could be put towards construction infrastructure could this if this gets if this gets passed and we're able to obtain funding could it be put forward towards stormwater management uh through you mr Statham. the the grant process uh, and the criteria that the, the grant system runs as uh, councillor marnie mentioned there are constraints on uh, how it applies to overland flow uh, which is one of the main contributors to this, uh, from the flooding from the stormwater system. But in saying that, uh, the council funds obviously uh, can be used for the purposes uh, that we deem fit. Uh, we would have to look at the full definitions in next year's uh, grants round uh, for the 2023-24 20, year uh, they're currently closed. Uh, so uh, they will reopen for next year. So we'd have to look at the full eligibility. But there may be constraints, as was identified. Yep. Thank you, Mr Elwood and Councillor Coleman. Uh, anybody else wishing to speak? Councillor McGee? Yes, I think the constructive thing of all of this is that it remains the conversation piece and at the fore of our minds. Floods are too often forgotten. Um, once they pass and the, the terrible damage that they wreak is done, It's um, quite easy for people to, you know, just get on with it and forget all about it. Uh, but that's what these sorts of things are address. And I have no problem with the point three, as I think that that will be a natural progression as these original plans and management plans are implemented and worked upon, then the natural progression will be to help our other areas as they become identified. But I think this is the first step to solving these issues and these problems and then with that experience it will only improve the entire area so i think it's just it's all good thank you councillor mcgee anyone else wishing to speak right of reply councillor yes, i'm sorry oh sorry I'm councillor just, goodwin 
I just have a question about um, probably more of a statement that it won't. We're talking about insurances, um, and it won't affect the insurances. But I think it does affect young people wanting to come to the lift, go and buy a house when they want to get a loan from the bank, and they're in a flood zone. Banks are very reluctant to lend new people loans when they're trying to buy a house in the floodplain area. It's probably more of a statement, more than a question. Thank you, Councillor Goodman. Anybody else wishing to speak? Yes. Yeah, just I'd like to clarification on what Councillor Goodman's saying from the administration. Is that the case? Because that is concerning. Do you have any comments on that through you, Mayor, through the General Manager, or whoever did the flood study? I can't respond factually, but it's like insurance. I guess the lending authorities, they determine their risk appetite um, and they have a regard for that in terms of their lending practices. Um, but we can't unsee what we know. And it's prudent, if I extend on the analogy or the example you're giving, it's prudent that we forewarn or advise anybody that's purchasing land that they go into it with their eyes open and that they know that it does that it is flood affected or subject to overland flow so we can't unsee and we've used good modeling we know one just has to look at the topography of this place that it does have flooding both mainstream and overland um, but uh, what insurance companies do and what lending authorities do in terms of their criteria is a decision for themselves Sorry, Mister. Just one more question. If this, if we get grant funding to, to clean up our waterways and our drainage systems, and and whatnot, will this alleviate the overland flood? And can we revisit the flood plan five or maybe ten years down the track so we can uh, sort it out if it's if if all the drainage systems have been actually updated to a modern standard? Mr. Elwood, uh, thank you. Uh, through you, Mayor Statham. Uh, one of the constraints with the uh, the one to two funding grant process uh, is that the uh, definitions of overland flow uh, are applied, uh, and as was as has been mentioned, uh, there's constraints on what we can use the funding for for overland flow. So a lot of the overland flow issues, if if they are arising from the stormwater systems. Uh, will probably have to be addressed through other means other than their grants funding, so probably through uh, council direct funds or the like. So, uh, yeah, we just need to be aware of that caveat. But just to add to what Mr Elwood said, then any strategy and plan should be dynamic. And um, so, yes, uh, we have a current model and we've used the new model and new data, rainfall data and prediction data and climate data, um, in this model. So uh, any strategy should have a cycle of periodic review. And so in those periodic reviews that we will do for this plan and strategy also, we will pick up where the works that have been done have improved the situation. And, you know, in an ideal world, uh, and the, there would be properties that would move out of affectation and their records would be updated. So the works are done. Um, to remove flooding from on private properties, uh, there'd be no need to uh, uh, to maintain a, a, a note of flood affectation. So, yeah, it would get better for people. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. General Manager yes. and Mr. Elwood. Uh, Councillor O'Connor. Yes, could I ask how the um, pipeline near the viaduct has there been any progress on the pipeline? To to alleviate the water under the divide up there. Thank you, Councillor O'Connor. Thank you, Mayor Statham. So yes, there has been progress. Um, uh, we're in the process of purchasing all of the pipe work that's required to go in and uh, underneath the rail viaduct. Um, the simple part of the project is getting from that uh, northern edge, northern boundary of the rail viaduct to Farmers Creek. The, the complex bit is under boring Great Western Rail Line. Um, so that process will take some time, but we're trying not to let, let to not let that complex issue delay the broader project. Um, but we're also looking 
to uh, appropriately design and cost a solution to alleviate the flooding impact at the intersection of Enfield and Main Street, because it's a similar problem, um, made much more simple by the fact that the uh, infrastructure underneath the rail viaduct is considerable, um, but it isn't impacted downstream closer to Farmers Creek. So it's about a $1.6 million-ish dollar project that requires amplification of the infrastructure around the Ferrero site, but we're working through that with our consultants to develop a comprehensive business case and we'll approach the council with that plan shortly. So just to add to that, one project is funded, so Cupro Street is funded and we're moving through the design. A little tricky getting under a railway, always is. That's the impediment, um, but as Mr Edgecom said, uh, we're moving that project forward and purchasing pipes, uh, but we're also alert that there's an issue at Enfield Avenue. And whilst that's not a funded project, uh, Mr Edgecom and his team are working with designers to, uh, to arrive at the solution. With that solution, we can then pursue the pursue the funding, not under this program, because it, unfortunately that intersection and that work isn't currently included in this plan. But once we've got it, we'll find other ways to fund it for the design. Thank you, Mr. Edgecombe, uh, the General Manager and Councillor O'Connor. Uh, anybody else wishing to speak? Otherwise, write a reply, Councillor Ring. No, please you. put the motion. I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Unanimous, thank you. Strengthening, strengthening our economy, proposed study visit, the Trobe Valley. Can I have somebody move this, please? Councillor McGee, a seconder, thank you. Councillor Bryce, Councillor McGee. Yes, um, the Lithgow Emerging Economy Plan, a fantastic document that's been worked on since we've been on council. The information in there, is very new to us, to new to our area. And I think for, for me to have the opportunity to visit advanced, more advanced in this transition process than us would be very advantageous. I can see that um, meeting people in a similar situation, businesses, um, councillors, being nothing but a benefit uh, to the area with the information and the experience that would be returning to the Lithgow LGA. Um, sort of the way that I look at it is that, you know, no one knows everything and being a gardener is reminds you of that every day. There's always new ways of doing things and, you know, just every little bit helps. And I think to visit an area like this in such a very similar situation um, is a very good idea. Thank you, Councillor McGee. Councillor Bryce. I think this will be a very important part of our um, professional development as councillors, especially in the, in the period of transition out of power and coal. La Trobe Valley went through it a lot earlier than us due to the brown coal issues. And it'll be interesting to see how they, what they've learnt from what they've so far implemented, what went well, what didn't go well, and what, how it would, have, um, would fit into our LEAP program at Lithgow. Yep. Thank you, Councillor Bryce. Councillor Cole? Yes, thanks, Mayor Statham. At the November meeting, 2023, I asked about the possibility of Christmas markets, so I was told no budget was available. At the January meeting, it was raised that the opera event resulted in a loss of $21,000. So let me understand, the special rate variation supports the LEAP program. This recommendation wants the LEAP program to fund a study visit to La Trobe Valley, which is in Victoria, at a cost of $10,080, up to. I do believe the knowledge would be interesting and valuable, but at $10,000, up to over $10,000, not very cost effective. I would recommend that Lithgow City Council and I move the following amendment. I did give it to Trinity. That Lithgow City Council invite a representative from the Latrobe Valley Authority and the Latrobe City Council Council to Greater Lithgow 
We already have a relationship with Energy Australia, so we could reach out and ask them as well. I believe we can bring them here. All of us could benefit, obtain the knowledge we need, understand what we need to do in regards to transition at, a less, at less cost. Thank you, Councillor Coleman. Anybody else wishing to speak? It's an amendment. Yes, I need a seconder for that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Leslie. Councillor Coleman. I don't need to speak to you. I think I've All right. said my Councillor piece. Councillor Leslie. Uh, no, I just reserve my right to speak on that matter. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to speak? Yep, Councillor Ring. Um, it's an option to invite them up here. It would definitely be cheaper. But yet the Australian government's Cooperative Research Centre program is undertaking extensive research on regional economic development within mining communities and have completed to date six webinars that are available online and that are relevant to the LIFCO experience. The most recent project, 1.7, Collaborative Planning for Post-Mining Development in the Latrobe Valley Stage 1, has just concluded and we've posted online in due course. We don't need to expend a lot of money to answer the questions raised by the administration in their report. There's considerable information to assess the practical implementations, implications of the endorsed leap strategy and the key measures of success and failure in a regional scale transition. Energy Australia can present to council either locally or via a webinar on the closure of the Yellow Power Station. Same technology could be used to meet with unions, Latrobe City Council. And let's be clear, Latrobe is one of six councils that makes up the Latrobe and Gippsland area. Same with the Gippsland Tech School and Trade Centre. I'm at a loss to understand the following sentence on page 26 as part of the study visit. The council will have the ability to compare the Latrobe Valley Authority to what we know of the proposed New South Wales Model of Future Jobs and Investment Authorities. We don't have a clear understanding of the proposed New South Wales model at this time. What's the point of a comparison? In the end, we will work with whatever the New South Wales government establishes. Comparisons to me are relevant. It's interesting that in the Lithgow Economy Transition Plan, there's not one reference to the Latrobe Valley Authority, not even in the bibliography. I think any reasonable person would assume that our document would have referenced that work in the pitfalls of Latrobe because there have been a lot of pitfalls and a lot of money spent. But it doesn't. So why is it important now to go down? I don't agree with going down. Um, having people come up or having people do Zoom meetings would be much preferable. I don't believe we can justify spending money just to go on what I see as a junket. I believe that having people come up here is preferable to taking a number of councillors and staff to La Trobe. Thank you, Councillor Ring. Anybody else wishing to speak? Councillor McGee? Yes, uh, comparisons. I don't find them irrelevant, but I do find them odious. Um, I think that first-hand experience leaves staring at a screen for dead any day of the week. There is no comparison. Um, that's just me personally. Um, everything I've ever learnt has been on the job. And yes, I'm, I, I just struggle in front of a screen all day. It's, it's just not me. Um, whereas firsthand, when you're talking to people and looking people in the eye and hearing their story, those things you don't forget. And being firsthand, you're talking like this is businesses, tapes. This is much more extensive than just a councillor being delegated to, like, who would we delegate if we were in the reverse position? It's, it's a compromise. And I think Lithgo, we have pushed this far that we don't compromise at this stage. This is not about compromising the LEAP program at this very early stage. Thank you, Councillor McGee. Councillor Leslie. Uh, thank you, Mr. Atham. I had just intended to vote no on this uh, particular motion without speaking to it. But, but this amendment that uh, actually has some merit, it, it enables all the councillors, including those who 
such as myself, who had not planned to go to La Trobe, to actually be involved with discussions with the, those representatives from La Trobe, it also enables you know, a, a council, a briefing session or some other forum to, to discuss the, these matters with their representatives, with those La Trobe representatives, and, and to get you know, their own personal input into the, into the, the way that the La Trobe Valley has, has changed and had to develop over the, over the years. But we don't, we're not just limited to those people. We can now include you know, representatives from, as we've got on the bottom of page 26 here, from the Department of Regional New South Wales. So that gives us an even broader uh, scale and benefit by which we can, we can deal and, and try to you know, understand some of the more intricate uh, problems you know that are coming our way. We know most of them anyway, but it but it does help to to have it, you know, have a lot of people uh, able to dis discuss this matter. So I think that the the amendment is a is a great is a vast improvement on the original motion that was just, uh, as far as I was concerned, of little benefit to certainly of no benefit to me as I wouldn't be going, and I suspect of little benefit to. Lithgow City Council. Thank you, Councillor Leslie. Um, if there's no other speakers, um, Councillor Coleman, write a reply. I'll, I'll speak briefly. Councillor Sorry, Lonnie. Mayor Stoughton. I concur with Councillor McGee about I've got a similar learning style to yourself. Um, I am concerned about the costs. Um, I, I, I appreciate what Councillor Coleman has brought forward as a possible pathway where we can still have those face-to-face. -face. So, um, yeah, at this stage, I'm not convinced by it. Thank you, Councillor Marnie. Anybody? Oh, Councillor Goodwin. Yeah, Mayor Statham, this trip's available to staff and councillors through the LEAP program. And the budget for these trips, as the one that Latrobe Valley has all been included uh, with the LEAP program. So the budget's already been included for this trip and other trips or other things that we need to do. Council is encouraged to further their education and visiting La Trobe Valley, uh, which has successfully transitioned into a thriving area, can only be beneficial to the uh, to Lithgow. So, Thank you, Councillor Goodwin. Any other speakers? Yes, I want to speak against the uh, amendment. Thank you, Councillor Personally, Hunter. I'm not going down there, but if it's good education for the councillors, who's to say that uh, wearing up La Trobe that they say, why should we go up there to let go? They've, that's where the action is down there. So I support whoever council, councillors and staff want to go, I fully support them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor O'Connor. Um, right of reply, Councillor Coleman. Yes, thanks, Mayor Statham. Unfortunately, TRIP is what the general public will see. They won't see it as a study trip. They won't see it in benefit for them. The special rate variegation was rates collected for residents of Lithgow to benefit Lithgow. They won't see it a benefit to them. So, but I still feel as though we need to look at the opportunity of education. That's why I put the amendment forward. I won't be going to La Trobe. I won't be supporting the original recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Coleman. Um, I'll put the amendment. Thank you. All those in favour of the amendment? Call the Against. division. I'll call the division. Thank you. So. For the amendment, Councillor Coleman, Councillor Ring, Councillor Leslie, Councillor Marnie. Against the amendment, Councillor Bryce, Goodwin, O'Connor, McGee and Statham. Uh, so the amendment has been lost. The um, 
motion now goes back to the amendment now go, is lost, so we now go back to the motion. Uh, and Councillor McGee, uh, would you like to speak to that motion? Thank you. Yes, certainly. Um, to call this a junket troop is, is just ludicrous. Um, the reasons are quite plain, and people will see it, how it's described to them. If you describe this as very similar to a trip to the Gold Coast, then that's how people will see it. If you explain that this is to enhance our understanding of the LEAP program and better propel us into the future to be able to engage the LEAP program, because, as I said before, no one knows it all. Um, you know, like, people who think that they know what's in, in store for us, they're kidding themselves, because this is new ground for everyone around here. So to meet people with a little bit of experience, and it's more than just the council and, and a couple of councillors, it's, it's the businesses, it's, it's a couple of days of, it's, it's not gonna be that easy. It's not gonna be la lazing around on deck chairs beside the pool. Anybody else wish you to speak? Yeah, I would. Thank I'd just you. like to reiterate that a junket by any other name is still a junket. And this proposal serves no real purpose for the community that we represent. I cannot support what is, in my opinion, a complete waste of ratepayer money. Thank you, Councillor Ring. Anybody else wishing to speak? Uh, right of reply, Councillor McGee. Yes, only that I, once again, think that it is a um, fantastic opportunity. The money is set aside for these kind of excursions. The, also, we have money set aside for training and um, to visit conferences and things like that, which not many of us do. But to use it in this manner, I see as extremely appropriate. As I said, the money is set aside for these actions and to deprive the LEAP process at this very early stage would be just sinful in my view. Thank you, Councillor McGee. I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Against? I'll call the division. Thank you, Councillor Coleman, Ring, and uh, Leslie, and. Under normal circumstances, it's usually the people who vote in favour that you call first. I, I, I'm chairing the meeting. Thank you, Councillor Coleman, Councillor Ring, Councillor Leslie, Councillor. Point of Martin. order. I've, I've made my mind up. Thank you. Um, but, thank you. Uh, for but, the uh, Oh, motion, you're doing it backwards. Okay, I understand. For the motion, uh, Councillor Bryce, Councillor Goodwin, Councillor O'Connor, Councillor McGee and Councillor Statham. Uh, the, that is carried and it looks like we will say, have quite a bit of savings if the current councillors that voted against it are not going to attend. So well done. Thank you. 11.4, Enhancing Our Natural Environment, Destination Action Plan. Move it. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Councillor Ring, thank you. Um, DMS are a reputable firm with a very good track record in developing destination marketing plans. I've worked with some of their senior staff in a prior life in national parks, um, with them both as either staff or consultants. Um, the visitor economy is an important component of our economic transition, one small part, but it's still very important moving forward. This document will allow us, our community, to develop it, it to its full potential. It's not promising the world and acknowledges the need for additional tourism accommodation moving forward. Seeking a 15% increase in new accommodation by 2030 on page 20 of the report. Now, that's not a lot, but in terms of getting investors here to invest in serious accommodation, in the investor forum that we held through the chamber, very difficult to engage with the accommodation sector. But it's very much needed in this community because we have a significant shortage of overnight accommodation. We lose people to the Blue Mountains and to Bathurst on a regular basis, and that's not good for our economy. It also addresses revisiting the branding of Lifka. It may or may not result in the retention of the valley at Seven Valleys. But personally, I'll be interested in feedback from the tourism industry and the community on this document. Seven Valleys, I believe, was a good concept and the report makes it clear it wasn't developed properly or appropriately, and they will work on its strengths. 
So it'll be interesting to see where it goes moving forward. So I fully endorse this document. Thank you, Councillor Ring. Councillor Bryce. Uh, tourism will become an important part of our, um, our psyche as we move forward out of our transition from power and, and coal. It is important that we um, make sure we get it right. We had a, um, in the tourism committee meeting, we did have a, a presentation about the destination action plan. It was quite informative, quite good, and the tourism operators and were quite, um, you know, thrilled about the whole thing. So I'm glad to see it going forward. I want to see it out to exhibition and see what the community think, because this is really a big part of our um, LEAP program. Thank you, Councillor Bryce. Anybody else wishing to speak? Right of reply, Councillor Ring, uh, Councillor Marnie. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate the point Councillor Ring made about tourism accommodation, and um, Yes, and I'm afraid this is another broken record, but this is, I think, a failure at this council not to develop their housing strategy, which would have looked to these things coming over the horizon. Um, we've unfortunately put other things in front of that as a priority, um, but that needs to be considered in partnership with uh, the Destination Action Plan. I think the, the Destination Action Plan is a, is a continuing diversification. I'm not much of a fan of linear conversations about transition. Um, I, I think that we needed to be diversifying our economy early. Um, and this will provide certain sectors. It won't replace some of the high value employment sectors, the high profit sectors, but it's something that we as a council, we can manage to walk and chew gum at the same time. And it's and I, I, I look forward to uh, people's response to it as it goes out to the community. I apologise then for talking, but there's um, been an invitation that hasn't arrived yet to do with housing. Um, yes, I'll let you know, Councillor Marnie. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to speak? Right of reply, Councillor Ring. Yeah, tourism is important. And we're all aware that there's a very well-established tourism industry in the Blue Mountains. But my understanding is for the Blue Mountains, as a component of their gross domestic product, it's 4%. Ours would be significantly lower. But we need a mixed economy moving forward. Our existing tourism industry is still in its infancy. It needs a lot of development. We have a lot of potential. And it's going to take a lot of hard work. It's not a panacea to our problems. It's just one component. And I'm glad that Council Mahoney raised the issue of, of housing and housing strategies because the increase in Airbnbs, not just within Lithgow, but in the broader community, is a very topical issue at the moment, not just in New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland. In some instances, you have more Airbnbs being advertised than rental properties. And it's something at some stage this Council will have to address. Thank you. Put the motion, all those in favour say aye. Unanimous, thank you. Financial statements for the year ended 30th of June. We well, yes, we moved that earlier, thank you. Eleven point five point two investment report February two thousand and twenty four. Somebody move. I'll move it. Thank you, Councillor Ring. I'll second it. Thank you, Councillor Bryce. Councillor Ring. Um, it's good to see in these reports, and I know it doesn't happen every every month, is how much money is in internal and restricted funds. It's very easy for people in the community to say council's got fifty four million, a hundred million in the bank. Well, we don't. All that money is targeted for projects, either through council resolutions or through grant requirements. So I really do appreciate seeing that in there. Um, and for the benefit of residents, I, 
I'd like to say the council has got a comprehensive investment policy, which requires council to adhere to state legislation. And the, the council isn't committed to securing the best possible return on investment for community with minimal risk. That policy is available on our website for anyone in the community who has concerns. But I'd just like to say thank you to Mr Gurney and his staff for putting together a good report. Thank you, Councillor Ring. Councillor Bryce. Uh, nothing to add to um, Councillor Ring's comment. Anyone else wishing to speak? Councillor Ring, write a reply. No, just put it, please. I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Unanimous. Thank you. Eleven point five point four program update oh, March three. Page point four. Right. I skipped the page, sorry. My apologies. Um, eleven point five point three Algas National General Assembly Conference the second to the fourth of July two thousand and twenty four. I'm happy to move. Thank you, Councillor Coleman. I'll I'll second. Thank you, Councillor Bryce. Councillor Coleman. The National Assembly is very important. It's, in, it's critical that we have representation there. I've attended on several occasions. It gives opportunity to both the Mayor and the Deputy Mayor to meet with other councillors, learn from other councillors. You also have an opportunity to debate if you can. And I understand the General Manager also has an opportunity to meet with other General Managers and learn from them. Uh, well, sorry, yes, he won't be here. I apologise. <laughs> But however, it's important that we have representation at this conference. Uh, Councillor Coleman, I think um, Mr Gurney will possibly be Acting General Manager at that time. That's fabulous. Sure. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Councillor Bryce? No? Anyone else wishing to speak? Councillor McGee? Yes, just to reiterate what uh, Councillor Coleman said, it's a fantastic opportunity and as we said before, like with the, the trip to Victoria, it's very important these face-to-face -face meetings with extensive access to other local governments and to other people, as diverse an amount of people as possible. So I can see great value in this. Thank you, Councillor McGee. Anyone else wishing to speak? Right of reply, Councillor Coleman. Yes, Mayor Statham, a question through you. Through to Mr Gurney, what's the budget allocated to this, please? Oh, through you, uh, Mayor Statham. The Councillor Facilities and Expenses budget uh, sets aside a, a separate amount for the, the conference that equates to what we normally, the number of delegates the Council normally sends, so that's usually three, so there's sufficient funding for that. The amount, sorry, Mr Gurney, the exact amount, how much is the budget put aside? I'd have to take that on notice and get back to you. So $6,000, is it? There would be sufficient budget for that amount, yes. Thank you. $6,000 is a bit different to $10,000. That's why I support this. Eleven point five point four SRV program update March two thousand and twenty-four. Have a mover, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bryce. Second. Thank you, Councillor Goodwin. Sorry. Um, just one minute. Councillor Bryce and seconded Councillor Goodwin. Yeah. Councillor Bryce. We're just noting the update of the progress towards achieving the outcomes, that's all. Often... <coughs> Thank you, Councillor Bryce. Councillor Goodwin. Yeah, Mr. Statham, uh, reading this report, there are so many uh, great achievements that we've achieved through having the SRV so far. There's 14 operational maintenance outcomes that have been achieved. I won't run through all of them. Um, that's on page 47. On 
page 48, we've got other operational outcomes, which there's four, and capital works outcomes that have been achieved, there's four. So we are actually moving forward with lots of great, um, great outcomes. And Thank achieving. you, that's a good one. Anyone else wishing to speak? Right of reply, Councillor Bryce. No. I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Carried. Thank you. We move to Council Committees now, which is 12.1, Sports Advisory Committee meeting, the 14th of February 2024. I'll move. I'll second. Thank you, Council Bryce and Council Goodwin. Council Bryce? Council Goodwin? No, nothing needs to be said. There's no, no dissent. I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Carry it. Thank you. Twelve point two Economic Development Committee meeting minutes the eighteenth of March two thousand and twenty four. Could I have a mover? Thank you. Thanks, Lord Connor. Have a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Bryce. Councillor O'Connor. Uh, yes, uh, through you, I asked uh, Mr. Edge come about Willerwang Main Street when it was tabbed, on each side of the road, there's a drop of maybe 300. It's an accident waiting to happen. And I thought there was supposed to be action on it, but nothing has happened. I'm sure I asked the last economic development about it. Uh, we'll provide a memo to all councillors, possibly tomorrow. Thank you. Councillor Bryce. Thank you, Councillor O'Connor. No? Anybody else wishing to speak? Councillor Leslie? Uh, thank you, Mr. Anthony. I wish to speak to two items in this. Uh, for the minutes, uh, item 5.3 and item 5.4. Uh, in item 5.3, which is completion of investment prospectus. Now, I raise this matter because communication with the state government in the past has been dismal. I refer to the line item in, in the report, underutilised rail infrastructure and buildings. Uh, this is mentioned in the summary of key endowments, strengths and challenges. But we've had no follow-up on this underutilisation of rail infrastructure and buildings. You know, silence on this matter. But in 2018, then Deputy Premier Barilaro announced that a train maintenance depot would be built. Lithgow Council was not notified before this decision was made, was not even able to make a submission as to why, uh, why Lithgow Council should be considered or Lithgow Council area should be considered. And despite having Paul O'Toole as our state member and a cabinet minister at the time, neither was Bathurst Regional Council, which would have allowed a certain amount of overflow you know, to, to our area here. It makes sense, you know, that the possible industrial development should already should be built on already degraded land, which is what we have with our, our depots in Lithgow. But of course, that wasn't what happened. You know, the the Dubbo site was on a on a green field site, you know, which is I think is detrimental in it, in itself. So I, I just wish to make that point in, in re relation to the minutes. The other, the other one I wish to, to speak to is, is, is the minutes, uh, item 5.4, LEAP general update. And on page, point three on page 20, we, we get the, the, this, this phrase. You know, formation of the council's interim governance vehicle. Well, I'm afraid I can't support the self-serving comment. It was incredibly open-minded of the council to support this model. A model? Sorry. A vehicle that has no councillor as a member. A vehicle 
that has the council's general manager as the interim chairperson, a vehicle where we, the councillors, could not even name the members because they're confidential. And, and here's a question. It, are the names of the, of the delegates or the members of that, that uh, committee, are they now available to be discussed, to, to be named? That's, that's uh, if I could just interrupt my comments to get an answer to that question. I may, I might Mr just, General Manager, thank you. I'll deal with both those points that Councillor Leslie makes um, with your indulgence. Um, as we spoke about at this Economic Development Committee, Councillor Leslie's right, we believe there's profound opportunities and lead points to that in terms of uh, the rail infrastructure and the history uh, of rail that we have in the city. Um, and indeed, there's a significant um, item being brought to the May information session uh, where uh, we'll be able to weave all of this together for the council. So we'll be talking about LEAP, about the opportunities uh, for hydrogen to pivot off rail, um, the opportunities for the allied skills that we have in our workforce in coal mines and thermal power uh, to be turned to rail industries, the opportunities for tourism, uh, the opportunities out of rail yards and sidings and National Pacific site, and also the opportunities for cross-regional connection. So it's widely acknowledged in LEAP and by the administration and this council about those opportunities um, into the future, and that will come to a May information session, so I absolutely agree. Uh, in relation to uh, the second item, well, we're debating the minutes here, um, and the minutes didn't then this item didn't deal with that governance vehicle. That governance vehicle was decided in a previous council meeting, but more than happy to deal with that if, if the Mayor wants in matters of great urgency. I am Mr. talking Jim about the, the, the LEAP general update, which of course includes the, the membership of the committee. Yeah, that, that's going to do it. We were advised of the members in a confidential report. I'm asking now whether that whether those members who were confidential, we know we know their op, their occupations and who they work for, but but their individual names have not been mentioned. Uh, is it yet? When, when will those names be released? Thank you, Councillor Leslie. Mr General Manager. I mean, I'm happy to answer it, even though it doesn't relate to the minutes that we're dealing with, but um, the, the Council endorsed uh, the composition of, uh, of the committee, um, and that is representative from the mining sector and representative from um, the power sector, a representative from the knowledge sector, uh, union representation, um, state and federal governments, as well as Council. Um, in a confidential memo, there were uh, suggestions about people within some of those organisations, but the council's administration is in the process of uh, in inviting uh, each of those sectors uh, and governments to nominate uh, their people for the committee. So as soon as we get some feedback from those, uh, those, uh, those sectors and those, those members of the committee, uh, we bring that to council and uh, the administration certainly looks forward to, to widely uh, broadcasting what the membership is and indeed standing up that committee and setting it to the important task of implementing LEAP. Thank uh, you, Mr General Manager. Thank, thank you, Mayor. I w would like to just question that. It's, uh, if it's not in the minutes, then it's the minutes that, have, that are in, in, in failure, not, not because it is in the agenda of the of the of the meeting itself. And so it's part of the agenda that we discussed at the Economic Development Committee meeting, and therefore I believe that any matter that was discussed at the Economic Development Committee meeting is a, is a, is a reasonable matter to, to discuss here at this meeting. Uh, and so, so at this stage, no, we don't know the, we don't know the names of, of, the, of the members of the committee. Right, I got that. But there, are, but there are matters of this interim governance vehicle that we, we also 
need to be considering. Is this relevant to the minutes? Yes, minutes? because yes. it's... It, yes, Fine, yes, no thank worries. You. Thank, I'm, I'm sure it is. The vehicle has no member associated with more modern technology, such as manufacturing, pharmaceutical, information technology, or the Chamber of Commerce, either, either local point, or point statewide. Of order. The composition of the committee was already decided at another meeting. So, really, we don't need to be dis no, discussing. You, you, you may not wish to speak to it, but I wish to. If you don't yeah, wish to no, speak to it, by all means, no. We've already dealt with it, so why do we do need to bring it up again? It has here power, which are mining power knowledge. Is that correct? Is there one there, did you say, for knowledge? And uh, I assume and presume, and hopefully I'm right, that the person, whoever is going to represent knowledge, has a vast knowledge of what our incredible LEAP program is going to uh, come do to this community. Well, I can only hope you're right, Councillor State, but we don't know, do we? Can we act on that point of order, we please? Can't uh, name, look, I'm we can't not name going them. to go through this again, Councillor Leslie. Please refrain from saying it again. I accept your point of order. Can we please move on now? Thank you. I'm so, like your, Councillor Coleman, thank you. I'd like to speak to this as well. In the Economic Development Committee meeting that was held on the 18th of March... Sorry, just, could I just interrupt for a moment? Are you, you're shutting me down then. No, no, but, no, Excuse no, me, you, Councillor I, Leslie. I would have liked to continue, but... Uh, well, Councillor Coleman would like to commence, thank you, and you had a long time speaking about something that's... So, so you are shutting me down? If that's what you'd like to call it, I, I don't thank say you. I've shut you down. I have asked you to keep on topic a number of times and I'm asking you to do now and allow Councillor Coleman to take over where you left off if she wishes to. Councillor Coleman, please speak. I'll start again, shall I? Okay, thank you. Economic Development Committee that was held on the 18th of March, you, Mayor, mentioned the carriages that were at Short Street or Inch Street. I remember that being in the meeting. And my understanding was that the general manager was going to follow up, but I'd just like some clarification. My understanding of why those carriages are there is because they were made in Korea, they did a guard department put into it, and they're currently being shunted between Lithgow and Tugra until this, until in this time this happens. Some have been moved to Mount Vic. So they will be there until it's corrected. So can we get some clarification? Is that your understanding? Through you, Mayor, through to the General Manager. Mr General Manager. I'd have to take it on notice. It's not a matter for Council, it's a matter for the State Government, so I'd have to get advice from the State Government and provide that uh, to the Council by way of memorandum. Thank you. I just raised it because I remember that your good self, Mayor Statham, absolutely you raised it. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Council Coleman. Uh, I wasn't at the meeting. But I would like to speak to the prospectus documents prepared by regional New South Wales. I think they're extremely high quality documents. I've worked with the department for the last two years. Uh, they're well aware of the endowments and the issues within this community. And we're also aware of the potential for rail, rail line going into Green Spot. And also now there are discussions, particularly with Centennial, about um, the adaptive reuse of mining sites as they close down and the regulator is starting to talk and that was discussed at the investor forum and there is interest in the investor community in looking at those options moving forward. I'd just like to congratulate them that they are good documents and I think working with them will assist this community greatly. Thank you, Councillor Ring. Anybody else wishing to speak? Uh, right of reply, Councillor O'Connor. Thank you. Thank you. Unanimous, thank you. I'll have my name recorded against that. Oh, sorry, Councillor Leslie, I missed that. Um, can I have a, um, a division, thank you? All those in favour? Rice, Goodwin, O'Connor, McGee, Marnie, Leslie. No. Sorry, uh, Marnie, Ring, Coleman and Statham. Against is Councillor Leslie. Thank you. 12.3. Committee meetings that did not proceed. Uh, you'll have that information there. Can I have somebody move that? I'll move it. I'll second. Thank you. Any debate on that, Councillor Bryce? No. Mm -hmm. 
No, I, if, if no one's got an issue, I think we'll just put it. Yeah, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Against? Carried. Thank you. Delegate reports. Uh, the Joint Organisation Board Meeting Delegates Report. Can I have somebody move that, please? I'll move it. Thank you, Councillor Bryce. Second, I'll second thank it. You. Thank you, Councillor Ring. Councillor Bryce? Just noting the report. There's um, all the information is there. Thank you. Councillor Ring? Uh, there are a number of items on there I'd, I'd like to get further information on. As the gentleman indicated, he'd provide briefings. I'll send him a, an email advising him of what I'd like further information on. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ring. Anybody else wishing to speak? There's nobody. Councillor Bryce? No. I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Unanimous. Thank you. Business of great urgency this evening. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Statham, I have one. I have an urgency motion about the safety issue of the potholes on Piper's Flat Road between Portland and Wellerawang. Please note it's the safety issue that I'm concerned about. You'll recall that Councillor Goodwin raised this as a matter of urgency at the extraordinary meeting held two weeks ago. You'll also recall that he accused me of not thinking safety was an important matter. You declared the matter to be urgent. See the minutes printed here tonight. You also said this will be dealt with tomorrow. Can you explain why, two weeks later, nothing has been done? And remember, this is a safety issue that Councillor Goodwin was very concerned about, and I, and I, and I agree with him. It's a safety issue. I'd like to know why, two weeks later, nothing's happened. Mr General Manager, thank you. Uh, through you, Mayor, um, the matter was um, certainly uh, forwarded to the infrastructure services area the day after, and indeed Councillor Goodwin again chased me uh, within the first week of him having raised it, and I pursued it again. I'll get advice tomorrow, but I can only presume that the infrastructure services area are dealing with it with the priority that the Council requested, as did I and uh, comparing that against their other workload, but advice will be provided tomorrow. If there's no other business, I'll close the meeting this evening. Is that 9 o'clock? 8.57. Uh, at 8.57. At 8.57. Thank you for attending. Thank you to the public gallery.